All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're just going to pick right off uh, where we left off uh, yesterday. Uh, we were exploring PV Watts, and uh, we kind of encouraged you to go to PV Watts and experiment with your your local production. Uh, and what we learned was that the you know kind of surprisingly, and we're going to revisit this, but the the tilt angle and orientation of a solar array does not matter as much as we think. I mean, we think in what's the sun, you know, it, it rises in the east, sets in the west, and it's in the south part of the sky because we're in the northern hemisphere. But it's really more three-dimensional than that. You know, the sun is really up, uh, especially in the summertime. So the impacts of tilt angle and orientation uh, do not matter nearly as much as like an ill-designed solar array that gets a lot of shading on it. Uh, if you take a solar array on a rooftop and it's facing south and you rotate it to east or west, you're going to lose about up to 15% of the uh, the system production. You might think, well, isn't that kind of a lot? And I guess it is, but you're also doubling the project size. So if you can achieve you know, a 20% discount by doubling up on your project size, it actually might be more cost effective to do a larger array rather than a smaller array. Uh, one kind of pro tip that I see uh, in the residential sector is companies selling one pallet of solar to a customer. And that really optimizes the, the shipping and project efficiencies in some cases and uh, just makes your projects a little bit more profitable. Uh, so with respect to PV watts, being able to estimate uh, solar performance, one of the most overlooked features is uh, highlighted in, in this graphic. And so what you need to remember is uh, once you get to the last screen on PV watts, where you get the total system production per year, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can download the results. And if you download them monthly, it's just kind of what you see up here, the the month by month results, which this is useful because it actually tells you uh, what are called sun hours, where uh, if we reduced uh, daylight into uh, a standard test condition hour of sunlight, how many hours of sunlight in the day would that be? And so equivalently in like January, 3.27 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day of your system at its rated capacity is kind of how it goes. And this, this information is also applicable to solar thermal collectors uh, as well. But if you scroll all the way down, you can download the results and get to a uh, hourly download rather than monthly. And what this hourly download is going to do is actually give you a, a hour by hour breakout of your system production for every hour of the day, every day of the year. And it pulls the environmental data from your local weather station into this report, and it'll tell you the irradiance on the array, the, the cell temperature of the module, which will actually change between if you select it's a roof mount, which is hotter than a, a ground mount down on the ground, uh, you know, less, less, the solar array will absorb less heat. Uh, and then you also get the DC output and the AC output. And this is very useful information for right sizing the inverter. Um, so what we'll do as an example is for Kansas City, Kansas, it's kind of the, the middle of the United States and kind of middle uh, electricity pricing and middle solar production. So it's nice uh, kind of average. Uh, one kilowatt of solar will produce 1,387 kilowatt hours a year on a 412 roof pitch. And you do have to remember that the more extreme the tilt angle of the module, the more the tilt angle and orientation begins to matter. Like I would not modify, in most cases, the, uh, the orientation of the building around solar. I might simplify the roofing planes because of solar, but uh, in, in the news recently, there was a, a picture of Tesla's uh, solar array in Puerto Rico. And, you know, what they actually did was just have the modules be kind of flat laying across a parking lot. They're like, that gives us the most energy density 
and we have a limited amount of space to collect our uh, sunlight in. And so they didn't even, you know, care about the tilt angle and orientation of the modules in an emergency setting. So you know, people care too much about tilt angle and orientation. You really just want to use the, the surfaces of the roof that make sense. And if that means designing a, a palette of modules and having one circuit face east, northeast, and two circuits are facing uh, south, southwest, you know, so be it. It's not a, a big deal to have a off-center uh, solar array up on a rooftop. It'll still get plenty of sunlight in the summertime, as PV Watts will, will show you. And furthermore, when you think about the, the value of electricity and how we use our electricity, typically we use more electricity in the summertime and less electricity in the wintertime. So that summertime electricity is worth more than the wintertime electricity. Also with net metering, if, you're, if your outflow is worth less than your inflow, then you want to consume as much of your solar electricity as you can. And so for a variety of reasons, perhaps a less efficient roof surface, when you see a 15% difference in system efficiency or even 30% difference in system efficiency, often there are other factors that will narrow that gap and make the, uh, the off askew uh, rooftop surface still retain some value. Uh, for instance, in, in Alaska, you know, you would want to have a solar module hanging down the side of your building uh, so that it wouldn't get covered by snow and you'd have a source of, uh, you know, emergency power that's hanging 90 degree angles. And maybe in Alaska, that would also make sense just because they're so far north. Anyway, there's a concept of right sizing the relationship between the solar array and the inverter, because when we talk about module wattage so like this is a 250 watt solar panel and this is a one kilowatt array that wattage is done at standard test condition uh, so that's the laboratory test uh, kind of like the mile per gallon rating on a vehicle it's done in a controlled environment uh, according to a series of rules which are actually not very indicative of field performance um, so anyway, what we're, what we're seeing is that on a 1,000 watt solar array, we go and we download the, uh, the hourly PV watts data, and we can determine that only 16 hours of the entire year are, uh, is the solar array above 800 watts. And so we don't really need an inverter that's a thousand watts. The output capacity of the array for you, you count all of the hours of operation for the entire year, it only goes above 800 watts for 16 of those hours. And the maximum it goes up to is 874 watts. And so if we bought a 1000 watt inverter, we would be overbuying our inverter capacity. Now, is that the end of the world? Not really, but, you know, it would be better to spend your money elsewhere. Um, and so there, there's this concept of right sizing where generally uh, your inverter is undersized from your solar array around 20%. Now, that's assuming there's no batteries. You're just trying to dump all of the electricity into the grid. Uh, so at standard test condition... This one kilowatt array consists of four 250 watt modules. But if you get into the module specification sheet, you will find uh, you know, what the operating voltage and amperage is, you know, what the maximum voltage is, but that's all at standard test condition as well. And so what we're seeing is standard test condition is up here. It's where the, the irradiance is at 1,000 watts per meter squared. And you usually only get that level of irradiance on kind of a, a bright, sunny day without much humidity. So say in Houston, Texas, yes, you have heat dragging down the performance, but you also have humidity dragging down the performance as well. It refracts, uh, refracts the light. You also get these uh, temperature coefficients that will say as you deviate from standard test condition. And standard test condition is a cell temperature 
of 25 degrees Celsius. And so uh, let's not convert Celsius to Fahrenheit just yet, but standard test condition is done at 25 degrees Celsius at 1,000 watts per meter squared. Um, so we look at the temperature coefficient of power per se, and we say, okay, for every degree Celsius we deviate from the standard test condition, we lose 0.4% of our energy. And these temperature coefficients also reveal how voltage and amperage are impacted by temperature. And, uh, and most electricians will know that you know, heat causes resistance, and that's going to decrease your voltage. Uh, but also heat will improve your current. But look at the, the order of magnitude difference between voltage and current. Whereas current will go up by 0 0.06, voltage will go down by 0 0.34. So there's like a order of magnitude difference. Voltage is much more impacted by system temperature than amperages. Um, I had one failure on an array where there's a, a fuse box that was placed on the rooftop. And the, uh, the circuit was, I think, a, a, around a, a seven amp circuit. And the installer did not have any 15 amp fuses on him. And so he put in a, a 10 amp fuse instead. And so, you know, all that's, you know, he's like, all that's going to happen is, you know, that 10 amp fuse will blow when it shouldn't. And disconnect the circuit and you'll you'll have to go replace it well he didn't that information never got relayed uh back and so that then we we got up on the box and it's like oh the it should have been a 15 amp fuse and lo and behold there's a 10 amp fuse in the box and that was also on uh the middle of july in austin texas with a roof mounted fuse box and it's like the hottest uh time of the entire year where the system would have been at full production, and that was enough to raise the current to 10 amps and blow the fuse. Um, voltage, however, fluctuates much more greatly. It, it drops in high heat. It also goes up when the temperatures drop below 25 C. So when uh, you know you get down to, to freezing point, your voltage is going way up beyond the 30 volts that it's listed at. And you know, obviously your solar array in most of the country once in a while is going to be, if not more frequently, below freezing point. And so your system is not going to be operating at 600 volts, but it can't exceed 600 volts. And so the design conditions for solar, unless you get an electrical engineering stamp, the design conditions are the coldest temperature on record but in the summertime, all you know, the, the hot end of things is less important. The the design temperature for uh, the the operating temperature is just the the average ambient high. It's not the the record high. Although if you want to mitigate against rising temperatures, maybe you do uh, pick out a little bit more robust inverter. Uh, not all of these inverters uh, can take you know the being outside in the heat. Even if they're rated for it, it would be better to locate them, you know, in a conditioned space if you can. So back to that Celsius thing, what is, how do we convert Celsius to Fahrenheit? Well, in ambient degrees, 37 Celsius is a 98 degree Fahrenheit day. Um, and that will give us a rooftop cell temperature. And this is something you get from PV watts. So we have the, the month, the day, the hour, and here's our cell temperature. And we can see, you know, in the middle of May, we're already at 35 C up on the rooftop at noon. And so getting back to standard test condition at 25 C, we're already 10 degrees C above standard test condition in the middle of May. So we've already lost 0.4 times 10% or 10 degrees Celsius, we've already already lost 4% of our system production on the roof from our system's wattage rating. And it's not even summertime yet. And so in the summertime, you might be losing 20% of your system production because of uh, the, the heat on the rooftop. And you're not 
ever getting to that maximum inverter capacity, whether it's in the winter time when the sun is low in the sky, and so your system's not powered up fully, or in the summertime when heat is dragging down your efficiency and your system's not powered up fully. And then guess what? In the, the spring and the fall, uh, your system is at its maximum because it's sunny and cool, but you're not using much electricity in those conditions, so your electricity is not as valuable. Let's also appreciate that the rooftop temperature of your solar modules can go up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, that's, that's hot. And so PV Watts is actually a, a very robust uh, data set within a very simple user interface. It will tell you the, the, what insulation you'll get on sunny days where your system will be at full capacity. It'll tell you how many days in a row you go with overcast days in the wintertime, which is very useful for off-grid planning. Um, you, you can simulate, is it better in an overcast day in the wintertime to have the modules up at an angle or instead facing straight up into the air because it's overcast and, and you know, the, the light is perfectly diffuse anyway. So exposing more surface area of the array gives you a, a slightly higher, higher power output. And so maybe those tracking arrays that go east to west are also good uh, up north in the wintertime for maximum system production on those uh, high electric use days as well. You can find out what your ambient temperatures are, not your record lows. You have to go search for that in the ASHRAE database, but you can still find out what your expected operating temperatures will be, wind speed, module surface temperature, uh, the hours of operation. What time of day will your solar array turn on in the summertime versus the winter time? And usually there's a, about a one hour difference. And so in the summer, your solar array will start turning on around seven and start turning off around six, depending you know where you are on the dateline. And then uh, in the wintertime, you might get two hours less of operation, and you can build your shade modeling off of that. Um, you know, how conservative do you have to be in your shade modeling? It kind of didn't, there's some elegance to it on where you position the modules on the array. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, solar customers aren't happy when their modules are shaded. So it's best to avoid the shade as much as you can. And then you can export all this data into Microsoft Excel for further analysis. You know, if you get your demand, building demand outputted, and you get your solar demand outputted, you can begin building a model for building demand management after incorporating batteries. There's solar design software that stitches this all together. Now, so the, the question is, is PV Watts good enough to present the data to a customer? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, remember that the data set is the same data set that uh, solar design softwares that people pay hundreds of dollars a month for pulls from. Uh, but the solar design software, you can fine tune the model. You know, it has all of the module spec sheets pre-programmed into it. So things like that temperature coefficient of voltage is, is precisely monitored. Whereas PV Watts is going to give you uh, a much more grayer area. So with PV Watts, it's, it is better to, you know, underestimate rather than be aggressive. Uh, but, but then again, when you're pitching at least uh, commercial and residential models, you you know you want to kind of under promise and over deliver rather than the other way around <laughs> just you'll have a, a more satisfied customer when you get into utility scale models or you get into models where you need uh, uh, you know high capital project financing they may require you to use commercial software to be a little bit more precise in your calculation uh, but let's go into what PV watts considers and what it doesn't um, Module type, you have an option of a standard or a premium or a thin film module. 
And what that's going to do is toggle the temperature coefficients. So you can kind of match up your module with uh, three different options. And all this stuff is documented. So you can, you can find out more by clicking on these buttons when you're actually in the software. The array type, it'll do roof mounts, tracking arrays, uh, you know, ground mounts that are fixed in place. Uh, so it'll do a variety of array types. You know, you only see a, a slight performance difference between a ground mount fixed in place array and a roof mount array at the same tilt angle. But it will pick up on, uh, you know, those subtle environmental differences such as ambient temperature on the rooftop versus ambient temperature, you know, on the ground and how that converts into cell temperature. Uh, system losses is really the big one. I mean, you can change the tilt angle of the array, you can change the orientation of the array uh, to however you want, but the system losses is, is the bulk majority of what you can customize about PV watts. Uh, keeping in mind those temperature coefficients are already picked up in your module selection and uh, your environmental condition set. Uh, so we'll, we'll explore the losses. Two percent for soiling. Uh, this is typical, but if you're if you're on a ground mount array uh, in uh, along a dusty road on a hay field that gets mowed regularly, you know the a ground mount gets a little bit more soiling than a, a roof mount. On the other hand, it's easier to uh, clean and identify when it needs to be cleaned. But generally, if you have a residential system, you're not going to clean it. You're just going to let it sit and accumulate a little bit of grime on the surface and, and then just wait until you have to get up on the roof for some other reason. And at that point, it is worthwhile to have, you know, wipe the array down uh, gently with uh, water and get all the grime off of it. Shading, PV Watts is discounting 3% for shading. I would leave this where it is uh, because what PV Watts is going to do is simulate the solar production as if the solar array turned on as soon as possible. And you have to wait till the voltage rises to a particular threshold before the inverter will actually kick in. And so we're just chopping off 3% uh, between the early morning and the late evening uh, to accommodate for that. Yeah, otherwise, PV Watts is really assuming that the array is going to be under full sun and, and not shaded. Snow, this is the big one. PV Watts has no snow considerations. So if you know you're going to get a foot of snow on your rooftop, you know, the, anecdotally, uh, the, it takes till about a 20 degree Fahrenheit weather uh, for the array to kind of melt the snow off of the array. So in, you know, the you know, Buffalo, New York, you might have to eliminate the entire month of December from your production, which is, it sounds worse than it actually is. I mean, it's bad if you want to live off grid. Then again, if you're living off grid, you probably in that area hang the modules down the side of the building. But if you're just plugging the array into the grid and selling back to the utility, you know, first off, when there's snow on your array, it's generally an overcast day, so that's not a very productive day to begin with. And then uh, your solar production is already substantially less in December as compared to the summertime. And you know, for those reasons, you might actually find that the performance difference <laughs> between uh, the summertime production of an array of a north, the, the performance difference of a north-facing array in like Lansing, Michigan. The, the difference in performance between that north and south face is actually closer together than in, say, Houston, Texas, uh, where there's more difference between north and south, even though Houston is much closer to the equator. You know, that idea of what is the ideal tilt and orientation of the array, it doesn't account for the fact that the Earth has an atmosphere. It doesn't account for those weather conditions that can also impact your solar design. So if you live in an area of heavy snow, you need to go and put uh, additional uh, discounts into here. Uh, although there are some factors that PV wants is too conservative on. One is the temperature derating. Uh, it, it'll give your modules generally a little bit harsher of a temperature derate than what's on their actual spec sheet. 
uh, module mismatch refers to uh, along a circuit of modules, the individual wattages are going to be slightly off base. And so when you unpack a pallet of 290 watt modules, some are going to be 290 watts, others are going to be 293 watts. They're just all lumped into the same 290 watt category. Now, it used to be that this was a plus or minus percentage category, but nowadays they just round down. So, you know, really mismatch shouldn't even be, be put into here because all of the modules are going to be uh, listed for that 290 watt rating that PV watts, you, you input that standard test condition rating at the beginning of your calculation. So, you know, this mismatch category could be completely eliminated. Uh, additionally, uh, it's like, well, couldn't you go and capture that additional wattage uh, for those more productive modules? And the answer is yes. You know, if you're using those DC optimizers or those microinverters, then all the modules are operating, you know, uh, independently of each other. So when I'm modeling microinverters or DC optimizers, I'll just go and eliminate this mismatch percentage in my PV watts calculation and still feel very confident in the estimate that PV watts is generating. Uh, voltage drop. So PV watts is saying you don't want more than a 2% voltage drop in your system. And that's generally true. It's almost uniformly going to be more cost effective on solar to, you know, maybe start by looking at the maximum cable sizing that your inverter uh, inputs and that your your solar connector inputs and your solar connectors are generally their maximum size is number 10 AWG and lo and behold uh, the the circuit conductors running from a solar array back to the inverter are commonly number 10 you know they, they max out the cable size for that connector standard it really should be a number 8 standard uh, which would be even more cost effective, but the industry, <laughs> there aren't any. It's just a number 10 standard. Um, and so you calculate voltage drop by looking at the distance of the furthest cable run back to the inverter, and you want that to be less than a 2% voltage drop, because this is just linear off the top efficiency that you're going to lose, you know, throughout the, you know, off the top of your solar production. Code, the minimum code is like 3% now uh, for voltage drop. So it's it's just cost effective to upsize your solar cables. A common practice would be to, to look at, you know, if, you're, if your MC cable can take number 10, you run number 10 back to the inverter. If your inverter output can take, you know, 2 watt output, then yeah, you know, if, you're, if your tap conductor can take a 2 watt connector, then, you know, go ahead and upsize your cable. Uh, where appropriate. You want to upsize your, your conduits, you want to upsize your connectors, and you also want to upsize just to keep your bill of material uniform. You know, you might find that, uh, you know, on one run, the conductor is smaller than the others because that one run uh, has either less modules or is closer to the point of interconnection. You know, you're not going to save any money by having a different cable size and, and conduct your know, conduit size for that one run. Connections, I'd keep that as is. Connections is anytime you splice a cable and then you tap it together, you're putting a little bit of resistance into that cable and that's going to you know make your system less efficient. Uh, not much you can do about that. Then we get into light induced degradation. We talked about that yesterday. That's those little channels that the electrons will etch into the cell as they make their way to the top. And that will eventually develop into a channel that will reduce the momentum of the electron. Uh, so light induced degradation is just a, a one time off the top rating. of They're, they're modeling a light induced degradation of one and a half percent. In my experience, that's conservative, but I'm, I studied that on modules in like 2013 to 2015, and uh, the industry has improved there and gained more knowledge about light-induced degradation since then. Uh, nameplate rating, this is a, a 1% uh, 
And that's just saying that I don't really, I don't really understand the nameplate rating too much. And to me, it's kind of a, uh, I, I lump it in with the light induced degradation. Um, and, you know, it's not modeling any system age. And I found that light induced degradation is, is more than one and a half percent. Now, light induced degradation is not the only kind of degradation. It's just usually the, the largest kind of degradation. So PV Watts isn't modeling, you know, the, the next, uh, you know, level of granularity. And so I just find that it's best to keep this number as is. You know, the, the one factor that I think is overestimated on PV Watts that could be just kind of ignored is the system availability. You know, this just takes 3% off the top of the estimate, and it says, hey, the, the grid is going to be out during that time when you could otherwise be productive. So you might have a power outage and the system turns off, or uh, I, I don't know, uh, you have to do some maintenance on the array so you can't use the electricity. But generally speaking, the array shouldn't be off for 3% of the year. That's, you know, nine average days. You know, that's like your system being offline for a, a week, which, uh, you know, it, maybe that depends on your project site. But that's where, you know, if you if you just go in with this default 14 percent loss factor on PV watts at the early end of the design phase and see if the project works, you know, that fine tuning. You know, right now, the way I look at it is PV watts has about a three percent fudge factor built into it but just your weather conditions from year to year can vary by as much as 10 percent so you know even if you if you go in with something more aggressive and the first year is a bad solar year you know you don't want to have a disappointed client so getting into our design algorithm you know we want to measure the roof we want to select our module inverter we want to uh you know, perform a layout, and this is where I start using solar design software to assist me. Uh, we do the energy estimate. You know, I commonly will use PV watts because, you know, I understand those factors. Confirm wiring configuration. You know, now all this stuff is, is automated, but it just follows National Electric Code rules. You know, you develop your racking balance of system material by putting your layout into the racking sizing software. And then, you know, at that point, you're pretty much ready to pass off for balance of system material development and uh, engineering review. So the, the greatest kind of economic mistake is it's not just about how much electricity you produce. It's also how much that electricity is worth. And so you'll see in the morning news, they'll talk about solar and say, well, that sounds like a great idea for sunny Phoenix, but we're up here in New York City where it's cloudy all the time. Well, they have a point. Your, your solar array in Arizona you know, may produce 50% more than your solar array in New York. But you know, guess what? <laughs> it's also you know, how much is your electricity worth? And if you, you just look at the average price of electricity, you know, the, the electric rate in, in Albuquerque is half what it is in New York City or, or more than that. We're talking about nine cents a kilowatt hour versus about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So, you know, the, the price of electricity varies much more greatly than the amount of solar production. In fact, if you look at the early adopters of solar, they're not in areas that are sunny, they're in areas where the price of electricity is very expensive. So why don't we get into the good stuff? Let's talk, let me see if there's any questions and then we'll start talking about our uh, project budget. So hang tight. All right. Um, Let's see. Don says the audio is breaking up at times. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what I can do about that. If it if it keeps going like that, let me know. Or if other audience members are having that, sometimes I might be rattling my desk or something without realizing it. Uh, we do make recordings of these programs available. 
uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll put my email address into the chat box now. So if you want to reference the material, you can always, oh, I need to send that to everyone. You can always send me an email. There we go. Um, what happens on the day that is very cool and very sunny? Do the do the inverters fall? So yeah, what we see is the system operates at its maximum amperage, maybe not its maximum power, but sometimes that is when it gets to its maximum power. You know, especially with the uh, the way the rooftop is angled. You know, especially in in uh, either late March or the beginning of April is that cool sunny day, kind of like the last cold front of the year. Um, and what can happen is if your your fuses are undersized, uh, they can blow. And then, uh, but if your fuse is well sized, you know that's why you design at you know kind of the the upper the the maximum amperage, and then you oversize by 25%, and then round up to the nearest fuse size when you're dealing with wire gauges of that size. Like you know it'll it'll blow the fuse before you. Uh, burn the wire up if you follow National Electric Code. You know, when you get into utility scale stuff, you'll actually be uh, taking the fuse and and it's not as it's it's more conservatively uh, matched. Oh, sorry about that. It's more conservatively matched to the load. Uh, is cooling the array practical, say in tropical applications? Um, I've seen YouTube videos that showed pretty encouraging results of uh, people installing rainwater collectors and then misting the solar array when at the hottest times of day. Um, but I don't know of any companies that are providing that as a commercial uh, service. Uh, there are some players in the utility scale sector who are uh, looking into that. But, you know, even while it may be practical in a lot of you know desert areas, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't rain. Um and, uh, you know, in the, the wintertime, you know, I often think, well, what if you, you know, ran a hot air vent and landed it underneath the solar array? Because you're allowed to, uh, you're allowed to mount over your vents unless those vents uh, have nauseous fuses. You know, if it's just hot air uh, on low circulation, you could, you know, heat the module and stay within the standard test conditions and kind of melt the snow off uh, if you're doing new construction. You know, make our homes a little more intelligent. So let's get into uh, pricing and pricing in, in solar changes. So I've just updated. I'm doing a residential project right now, and I got some updated pricing um, estimates. Uh, balance of system material cost. I consistently find that it's less than the the National Renewable Energy Labs uh, balance of system material. Maybe that just comes with thinking about it more. Um, but I find that that's overestimated. Uh, solar modules are right now, they're around 62 to 65 cents a watt. Uh, so that's, that's pretty consistent. Uh, you can find deals from module manufacturers that have terrible financial sheets and get discounted modules. You can also buy modules that are, you know, two years old. And, you know, they're not viable for commercially financed projects anymore, but they're just, you know, never sold through the inventory and drive that price down as well. Uh, and module pricing is stagnant right now. And it's, it's stagnant because there is currently a 30% import tariff on solar modules, and it's set to double uh, to at least 60%, if not more, uh, in the near future. So, you know, what that, it's not, it doesn't really raise the cost of the modules, but if you were doing projects in, say, Mexico, which doesn't have the uh, same import tariffs, you could be buying solar modules that are brand name, uh, high quality modules for 40 cents a watt and uh, doing a lot more project work. Uh, inverters. It depends on what inverter you use. If you use the, the cheapest uh, string inverter possible, you can find 
grid connected string inverters for 15 cents a watt. I almost never use uh, the, the cheapest ones because I don't like doing uh, service calls and, and maintenance issues. Um, and I'm not saying that on the cheap end, you won't, um, you won't have many issues perhaps often it's a, a matter of where you're where you're keeping the inverter you know if you're keeping the inverter in an outdoor condition you want to have a, a much more robust inverter uh, also there is you know the more expensive inverter the better the functionality so if i you know i like doing string inverters but i also like the string inverters with multiple powerpoint tracking and then the string inverter that i like uh, also has a dedicated output for uh, for power during a blackout without batteries, and it's also very good at at integrating with battery systems, and it's from a brand name manufacturer. So, you know, I like them. I used them before I went into string inverters and micro inverters, and so I'm I'm coming back to them now as I'm getting more into string inverters. But guess what? It's it's as expensive as the Solar Edge DC optimizer system. Uh, because it's it's a very robust string inverter. So there is a pricing gradient on your inverter systems. Generally, I'll budget around 30 cents a watt for my uh, either high-end string inverter or DC optimizer system. Uh, the micro inverters can be a little bit pricier than that, um, especially when you're putting them on every module. But then again, you can go and find cheaper and lower end string inverters. Uh, racking costs, uh, I've actually recently seen racking costs to be a little bit lower uh, than this, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but that's for a, a mainstream uh, flashed racking system. Uh, so I, I've, you know, when you, if you do a, a metal rooftop, uh, you, you will generally pay a little bit more, and I don't know, I find myself doing a lot of metal rooftops. Uh, general contracting, uh, what, so when I do, I got a, a contract recently, uh, for 77 cents a watt for labor. And when I go and I hire an electrical contractor, uh, to do the project on a time and material basis, generally their invoice comes out to be about 35 cents a watt. Um, yeah, in the, the half moon case study we'll get to in a minute it came out to be 45 cents a watt. Uh, this project in Mississippi, you know, a little bit lower labor rate's going to be come out to about 25 cents a watt. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's assuming that you're hiring an electrical contractor where you call them up and say, hey, can you send two guys to the job site? And we're going to have a supervisor out there, you know, asking quality control systems who knows what they're doing. Uh, but again, that's just using craft labor who have the hand skills of, a, of an electrician with a little bit of roofing knowledge uh, as well. Uh, then we go into engineering and uh, design fees. Uh, then we get into uh, the, the soft costs and, and markup. And so some of this might be contractor profit, although I don't know about you. I like making a lot more than that off of a project. Well, then there's also the overhead. So that's, you know, your, your business operating costs. So we can see that, you know, according to National Renewable Energy Labs, the, the mainstream uh, is trying to make about 60 cents a watt off of the project. Uh, but then there's also project permitting, markup on material. Uh, you know, some of the larger companies will actually, you know, pay really good sales commissions and command a higher price. Well, let's see. I had a magazine somewhere around here. Um, but anyway, there's an article in the recent uh, solar industry magazine that, that just showed a pricing distribution of mainstream solar installers. Um, but we, we throw in like just take kind of middle of the row pricing or kind of what I would do. Uh, you know, recommend on a project where you, you know, kind of, uh, you know, you, this is what the, the site supervisor takes home and this is what the general contractor takes home. Uh, and then you throw sales tax on it. You get to a solar price that's 246 a watt. 
And then if you if you go and you kind of use the cheapest materials possible, but you're still you know contracting out some solar services on the project, you get to you know under two dollars a watt. And then National Renewable Energy Labs is kind of saying that solar residential solar pricing should be around two sixty six a watt. Um, but over the last uh, two years. You know, solar module pricing has not changed that much, but solar installation pricing has remained over $3 a watt. And even on the low end cost side, it's more like $325 to $350 a watt. And on the high end side, it can go over $4 a watt uh, in some cases. And of course, doing project work in New York City is going to cost a lot more than doing you know, project work in a no permit zone in a rural part of the country, but it shouldn't fluctuate by that much. And so you know, the only thing that I would take out from that is that there's still a window of opportunity in this industry uh, to come in and deliver projects under more reasonable you know, mainstream uh, construction margins and be competitive with the uh, turnkey solar installers who might be able to deliver a higher end array, uh, but, but uh, maybe you can deliver a better price point. So just taking a look at module efficiency, you know, we use a, a higher end solar module uh, sun power at a 21% efficiency. And then we use a, a lower end Chinese solar module, even though they're named Canadian solar, um, at a 17% efficiency. So this would be like the, the what you could buy at, you know, 62 cents a watt is kind of the, 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 you know, you just want to do a one-off project from a distributor. You know what you want, but you know they've never heard of you before. They're a mainstream distributor. They'll probably sell you a, a pallet of solar modules for around 17% efficiency, around this much. And so you say, well, then how much does the sun power module cost? And that those modules range, uh, but it's around a dollar a watt. You know, they've come down in price, but it's still for the, the high end module, you got to pay, you know, high end. And so it's, well, you're, you're paying, you know, substantially more. And the, the payoff is that you can, you know, you essentially get around 20 to 25% more wattage out of your given service area. And so if you're, you know, I, you can go and, and run this. It's going to be somewhat site specific, but it's a function of electricity pricing and also real estate value and also how much roof space you have and how much electricity you use. You know, if you're using an all black solar module and knocking out your entire electric bill and then some, it doesn't really matter if you use a lower end efficiency module. And if you're in an area where electricity price is low and real estate price is 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 freely available, then you know go with a lower end module, and there's really no difference in value. Uh, remember, you know an all black module that is 250 watts looks exactly the same as an all black module that uh, is 290 watts. And so as long as the array, as long as the design looks good and you have a large amount of roof space or ground mount space, uh, then, then have at a lower efficiency module. But there still are markets where the price of electricity is high and the real estate is uh, you know, not as available, where it makes economic sense to go to the top shelf and absolutely pay up in the $4 a watt range for a higher end system. And that can get confusing because it's it says two different messages. You know, higher end is good, but lower end is good also. And the two camps kind of fight with each other about which is better. It just depends on your site location. Um, so maybe going with a higher end module will uh, add, you know, 25 to 50 cents a watt to your project cost. Uh, but you might be able to recoup that payback uh, fairly quickly, depending on the price of electricity. 
So uh, let's go in and look at uh, simple payback. Um, so what we're going to do is take the uh, – I think I did this a little bit out of order here. Um, but let's take our installation price, and we'll, we'll back out the 70% tax credit, and then we'll look at typical production and uh, average price of electricity – for Kansas City, Kansas. And we're gonna go and use the, the recommended National Renewable Energy Labs pricing of 266 a watt, uh, because we're building professionals here, and I'm confident that you can achieve that pricing on a, on a you know one pallet solar array. So at 260 a watt, taking out the tax credit, and then uh, you take your average production for Kansas City and your average production, your price for Kansas City electricity, you know, generally, when this number goes down, this number goes up, you know, not uniformly, <laughs> but generally speaking, that's that's the truth. Um, and generally, this this price goes way up. So generally, the less productive your system is, the more cost effective it is just based off the price of electricity. So what we're going to do is we're going to back out the tax credit. And then I really like to multiply these two numbers together. Now that sounds a little dorky, it probably is, but you know, if I take my solar production per watt per year and I multiply it by my kilowatt hour rate, what I get is a number that tells me how many watt dollars per watt per year my payback is. And so I say, okay, if I'm paying, you know, a dollar eighty-two a watt and I divide by you know almost 16 cents per watt per year. I get a 12-year simple payback. And I'd say that that is what is, is typical for most solar in the United States. And that is not large enough to create a market. Um, you know, what, what customers want, this is from a, a study, uh, one of my favorite solar reports that actually encouraged me to get into the industry, uh, but it was written back in, in 2008. And it said that you know, consumers want on energy efficient upgrade products. You know, they really want paybacks that are in the, the near term. You know, everyone's running out and buying LED light bulbs now because they're they're so much more cost effective uh, than incandescents. You can get your money back you know, almost immediately. But uh, a 12 year solar array, uh, it's a tough sell. And it really requires more uh, maybe long-term financing. You know, if you get a 20-year loan term, then your, your project can cash flow. Um, or it takes understanding the uh, nuances of real estate value. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But, uh, you know, what, what people want is a payback that is, is much more soon than that. Uh, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, actually, uh, the tax reform bill, it, it appears that, and right now I just think that this is on the uh, business end of the tax credit, not the residential end of the tax credit. They're actually two separate tax credits, but it looks like they're now going to tax the tax credit so that you'll actually pay uh, income tax on that. And so, you know, we're paying 60% import tariffs and taxes on tax credits. So that, you know, right now we're reaching a phase in the industry where the renewable subsidies are leaving the market. And we're kind of seeing where the market is going to stabilize around in terms of price and payback, at least until the import tariffs are removed, which is still going to be a few years before that happens. And so, you know, it's, it's, we're looking at uh, a 12 year payback and for most of the United States, but if you live in an area that's above average in terms of sunlight or electricity price, it's worth evaluating. Now, we have to know how much our electricity is worth to develop our economic model, and utility policies are different throughout the United States. There's no standard uh, net metering policy in the United States, so net metering can actually mean a lot of different things. Net metering can mean you don't have net metering and your net metering policy is we don't have a net metering policy. And that's 
you know, most of the world, that's how their net metering policy works. If they allow you to connect your solar array to the grid, uh, you know, Russia just passed net metering and, you know, they just passed the right to interconnect a solar array to the electric grid. And it's it's basically PURPA, you know, what the United States had all the way back in 1978. So, you know, <laughs> net metering policies are controversial. Uh, solar customers in the U.S. have enjoyed far greater net metering rights than other countries. There's also monthly net metering. And what that's going to say is on the day to day, you're buying and selling your electricity back and forth between the utility. But at the end of the month, you settle up and any surplus that you produce at the end of the month is sold back to the utility at a steeply discounted price called avoided cost. And your avoided cost value might be one third of retail price. It, it depends on your state public utility commission, but there is a federal law called PURPA, which is also being scaled back, that requires utilities to purchase renewable energy outflow at avoided cost. It actually requires them to purchase 80 megawatt generation back at avoided cost. And it doesn't have to be renewable. It just has to be cleaner than the electric grid. Um, and, and so this is not just a residential policy. It's also an industrial policy. It's not just a renewable policy. It's also a, a, a gas, natural gas policy called PURPA. You know, PURPA is where you can interconnect to the grid. You have the right to interconnect to the grid, but any electricity you outflow is going to be sold back to the utility at their avoided cost of operation. So if they were going to buy $10 of coal and then they were going to go and refine that coal and distribute it and transmit it, instead they can buy your refined, distributed, transmitted, emissionless electricity at the, the raw material cost of coal less an administrative fee. So depending upon how generous your utility is, they can really deflate the avoided cost and uh, you know really destroy the value of solar in that area if your system produces a lot of outflow. And so it might be worthwhile to look at a year's worth of consumption data and a year's worth of solar production data and ascribe a value to inflow versus outflow if you have that data available. Otherwise, you have to estimate it. Solar design software helps you with that. Or you live in a state where the Public Utility Commission uh, says, no, you know, we are going to incentivize people to put solar on their rooftop, and we're going to go pass a, a net metering law that says, you know, either at the end of the month or at the end of the year or, or never, you know, it just is unlimited rollover minutes. But that, that surplus credit that you're giving back to the utility will be credited back to your bill at the retail price of electricity. And that's a pretty dicey policy. It's been in uh, the political arena for, for years. And uh, <laughs> mistakes have been made on both sides in terms of uh, uh, establishing good common sense solar policy. And where a lot of the, the kind of of well negotiated, you know, what is fair solar policy for my particular state is going towards as what's called a, a value of solar tariff, where it's kind of like a, a revision of PURPA that says, you know, maybe, um, maybe net metering is giving too much away. And so, but, but maybe the solar array owners deserve something that's a little bit more than avoided cost. And that might be 80% the retail value of electricity or 60% the retail value of electricity. And that's where we're at in Mississippi. We have a net metering policy, but they're, they only give us 60% for outflow, but they call it net metering. You know, in other states like Minnesota, they take that value of solar tariff and they say, well, it's actually going to be above the retail price of electricity, but it's going to be fixed in place. And so what, solar will do is establish an upper limit that the price of electricity will not raise beyond because down the road the utilities will be purchasing solar at that rate 
Uh, net metering across the country is, is in general being rolled back. I don't think it's a, a good idea to design or, a solar array around a net metering policy uh, because for a few reasons, batteries are going to kind of eventually lessen the concerns. But with batteries, you want to strike a good balance between annual production and annual consumption. And generally, that means being more uh, accepting of east and west and north facing roof surfaces, uh, particularly when that means you can you know, substantially expand your project size and you still have the electricity and the budget for it. Um, you know, uh, accepting more production, accepting that there's going to be some outflow purchased at uh, the avoided cost. And so you want to achieve the economies of scale to still make the project worthwhile because it won't make sense at $3 or $4 a watt. So you have to do something uh, to, to shake up the economics of it. Uh, one thing you can do is take a look at your utility rates. They may offer a time of day metering structure where in the summertime you get a higher rate and then at night and all other times of year you get a lower rate. And depending on how extreme the difference is and you know designing your solar array for summertime production, you know, particularly in the afternoon, so like a west facing solar array, you can completely avoid the peak rate, and then whatever your price of electricity was, like 11, 12, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, now you're on the reduced rate at night. And so that way your solar array, um, you know, it, it generates during the day and it saves you money at night as well. And so that can actually improve the project economics. And so now we have solar design software that also incorporates economic analysis. And so like this is this is Aurora, and they're probably the most feature rich solar design software, but they're also uh, the most expensive solar design software on a monthly subscription fee. But what they do is they say, okay, well tell us your annual electric bill and then fill out a survey of heavy use appliances and based off your region, and your kind of electric load, they will estimate what your load profile looks like so that you can get a better understanding of when you will outflow and when you will inflow. Um, and then of course, as batteries come to market, um, as batteries get cheaper, every solar array owner out there will want to add at least a small battery to the array and some of the 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 on the market but they're very expensive now batteries can just slightly cycle and recharge and cycle and recharge and help with load shifting they're very expensive but they could you know when i was in the solar industry in 2008 the the cost of a solar module was three dollars and 25 cents a watt and now we're buying solar for 60 cents a watt and so that's that's so much cheaper <laughs> than it than it ever has been that we look at the battery market and has similar growth curves as solar did back in 2008 and 2009 and 2010 it's highly likely that those high end you know incredible cycle length batteries you know lithium ion phosphate batteries that are even too expensive for Tesla to use in the their electric vehicles these are these are you know you think of Tesla as being top shelf but these are you know ultra top shelf you know they could be 80% uh discounted just 10 years down the road so you just snap them onto your solar array and net metering will never be an issue anymore um uh, so just keep in mind, you know, you look at economies of scale and it says, well, and this is, you know, I wanted to, this is not the best point because this is in this. Well, let's, let's just look at the example. <laughs> we have a, a south facing solar array that's 4.6 kilowatts. And that's just if we did the south side of this building, assuming we chopped down the tree. So at 450 a watt, because it's such a small project that me as a contractor, I have to bill a lot of money for it. Otherwise, it's just not worth my time. 
you know, I would manage that project under a time and material basis and get my labor rate way down because the solar contractor is going to be charging you a specialty term key rate where the margins are sky high just so it's worth his time. Otherwise, he's going to go deal with more lucrative projects. And so at 450 a watt, take out the tax credit, look at your production for that south facing array. At 11 cents a kilowatt hour, you get a, a 21 year simple payback. But if I can do a solar array that is, you know, three times the size and I manage it and I get my pricing down and I take the tax credit out, even though the solar array is less productive than the south facing solar array, that production is worth more because it's producing very fine in the summertime when the price of electricity in Mississippi is 20% higher than it is in the wintertime, and the payback substantially reduces. And so that's where in the, the industry, it's like, how can we get the soft costs down? How can we deliver more projects at a reduced rate and then provide 20 year financing and, and make the projects work? And so if, if everything holds, if the, if the module pricing holds, uh, if uh, you know the, the the impact of the federal tax credit is substantially reduced, you know we're going to have to go into the mainstream and start utilizing our existing resources to get these projects out of the ground. Um, so you know the the general philosophy is cover the the south and the west surfaces, and then if you still have electric bill left and you still have budget left, then you're not crazy to go on to the east side of the roof. And then you're still not crazy if it, if it just makes sense for your material purchasing quantities to even go to the north side. You know, so keep in mind the, the avoided cost purchase rate can change too. So generally that electricity is cheaper in the winter time and more expensive in the summertime, at least during the times of operation of the solar array. You know, a flat roof will do well in the summer, a steep roof. You know, the problem with a steep roof is it really is more productive in the spring and the fall. And so a, a steep roof that faces east and west, you know, is, is actually a lot better uh, for, for shifting the production of the array than a steep roof that faces south. Because a steep roof that faces south will, will give you the most production when you don't really need it. Um, and then you could consider even bolting the modules down the side of the building. You know, in, in New York City, that's the only surface they have is the side of the building. The roof is already, you know, full up. And so you have contractors doing just that. It's worthwhile, even in overcast New York City, to bolt the solar array down the side of the building because their price of electricity is so high. So the, the number one economic mistake that I see contractors make is they, they overstate the value of depreciation. And so they, they look at residential and they say, OK, you take your solar array and then you, you take the tax credit and you divide by your production and your generation rate. And that's your simple payback. And at this point, this is where the mistake is made is the contractor goes on to say, but if your business owns the array, you also get to claim depreciation, and that's another 30%. So the payback is a lot quicker on commercial than it is on residential. Now that's a very common mistake. And the mistake is uh, it's true that commercial get to pay depreciation. And there are incentives to accelerate that depreciation, whether it be Section 179 or uh, Macker's depreciation. You know, they kind of change year to year. Um, but in general, you get a five-year depreciation schedule on the solar array. And, and that can be a slight tax advantage. But what the solar installer who says that leaves out of the model is that the, the commercial business who owns the solar array also has to pay income tax on the uh, revenue that the solar array produces. The revenue that goes into the residential bill is not treated, uh, doesn't have a tax treatment. The, uh, the commercial, though, 
you know, either you're selling the electricity to someone and that gets taxed or you are reducing your corporate electric bill. And so you have less expenses. And so your profit goes up and you pay, you know, there's still a tax effect on that revenue. And so the, the impact of depreciation and income tax is that they kind of balance each other out. And so depreciation really is not an incentive because while that's put on the table for a commercial project, the uh, income tax of the revenue stream is also uh, put on the table. The value that is most left out is um, appraisal value. Um, yeah, uh, we're, we're going to get into uh, batteries and demand management uh, in the, the, after the break. Appraisal value is uh, probably the least understood. You know, it's worth it to start networking with your real estate appraisers to see if they're even appraising solar. In areas of, of very few solar arrays, there's not enough appraisal data to determine the value of solar. And so in an area like Mississippi, you may not be able to incorporate solar into a mortgage and you might have to rely on a private financer. Whereas in, in California, you, you need to incorporate into your mortgage. You know, it's, it's no coincidence that just this year, I started to get phone calls from solar financing companies, you know, wanting me to install solar arrays for them in Mississippi you know, because now California is getting conventional financing. Uh, but what the data from California says, and you have to take this with a grain of salt because it's back in 2015. It's also in California, in Arizona, in states where the in Nevada, states where the price of electricity is higher than average and also places where solar production is higher than average. So, you know, if I live in the, the middle of the United States, I would still reduce these numbers by about half. Uh, but what, it, what these say is there is value, there is real estate value that's added to the home by putting solar on the rooftop. And at the residential level, that value is not established by the cash flow that the solar array produces. The value is instead kind of on top of the cash flow. And so what I mean by that is you know you still do your simple payback calculation and say your solar array has a 12-year economic payback the the real estate value doesn't really improve that but the concern is well what happens if i move at year six or year seven how am i gonna kind of cash out or am i just gonna lose my investment and the answer is no there is real estate value your home will sell for a higher price but that's why aesthetics are so important that's why it's worth it uh, to get that all black module and do that internal wire run and make the array look good because there is a price premium. It's called curb appeal. And so when the new home buyer pulls up curbside, you know, they look and they see the home with a solar array on the rooftop and they don't think, you know, oh, I'm not going to pay an electric bill. I mean, they, they might think that, but they really don't have knowledge of, you know, how much electricity the array will produce or what the price of electricity is or the nuances between time of day metering. They just see solar and think low electric bill. And maybe not in your high end homes, your million dollar homes, you know, the homes where the customers don't care about their electric bills. But for your clients who care about their electric bills, there is a premium that they place on a solar home. And so in, in 2015, out of a survey of 4,000 solar homes and uh, 19,000 non-solar homes, you know, what came out of this was that smaller solar projects, like three, three kilowatt, four kilowatt projects are commanding real estate premiums in the three to four dollar, you know, in this survey, it says, you know, out in California, a three kilowatt or a four kilowatt solar array still commands a 450 a watt market price. And so even if you cut that number in half to 225 a watt, you know, you might be doing a four kilowatt solar array in a rural area and getting a 21 year simple payback. And you might be thinking, well, I'm never gonna get my money back. You know, that's I'm never gonna be able to do solar because it's a 20 year payback and that's that's just not, you know, how do I how do I get my money back? 
you know, the answer is, well, you know, if you do a, a well-designed solar array, you know, you will retain, you know, some payoff in uh, at the time that you come sell your homes. In the more developed solar markets, uh, that data set is actually enabling real estate appraisers to write the solar array into the mortgage. Uh, so, you know, it might that data might not be available in your area, but it does exist uh, in uh, popular solar markets like Florida and California, New Jersey. You know, I like working with builders. I like finding out the contractor who's done work on the building and seeing what design resources they have. You know, we, when we did Half Moon's project, uh, they were expanding their building. So I got to work with their builder and, he, you know, that gave me a lot of design information, like the the tilt of the roof, the gauge of the metal, um, you know, the, the I mean, you know, the, the building set, I had never seen this kind of roof before, where it was a, a corrugated roof on top of purlins that were on top of rafters. Uh, and and so it was, I was like, well, can you can you just go up into your attic and snap a photo? And, uh, you know, what I have found is that the site evaluation is really just walking around the job site, snapping uh, detailed photos of how the roof attaches to the rafters, how the rafters attach to the walls, you know, what the electric service looks like, you know, what the, you know, heavy duty appliances are and what the electric bill is. Uh, none of that stuff is, is essential for being on site as long as you have a client who's willing to walk around with their camera and take pictures. You know, the, the common recommendations is to put hurricane clips between your building wall and uh, the rafters. Uh, you do have higher end contractors uh, sistering uh, or doddering the rafters together so that they drive their lag screws uh, into the two by four instead of the rafter. Uh, that's not absolutely necessary. Uh, there are solar racking systems. Uh, they're not for the faint of heart, but they are rated for the pull strength of the surface board. Uh, so if you're, you have a, a building where uh, the rafters are off center and the attic is not accessible, there are still racking solutions out there for you. There's even solar companies that are mechanical or structural engineering companies where you, know, you, pri you provide them enough of a detailed site evaluation uh, that they do solar residential stamping services. So back to our half moon uh, design exercise, you know, half moon, they, uh, they don't have a, uh, they have a metal roof. So flashing is not really going to work. And I don't want to uh, poke a hole in their roof and cause a leak. So, you know, we're dealing with a corrugated metal roof. So that was a, a bit of a design challenge. Um, we're going to come back to these, this data in a minute. You know, here's a, a picture of a, a racking system that's actually just designed for the, the, to be mounted to the decking. And they do make some compelling arguments. They say, well, you know, when you, when you retrofit flashing underneath a shingle, you're just asking for trouble because uh, you can, you're either busting roofing nails as you go along, which could cause a leak, or you are cutting your flashing, so you're really not even doing what you think you're doing because you're not getting, you know, the flashing underneath the shingle. So, you know, retrofitting is not a perfect process, and a lot of solar arrays are retrofits. And so what this company says is, you know, we're going to use a industrial butyl um, mastic that is super waterproof, and then just put enough fasteners through the shingle uh, to get the pull strength into the decking. You might say, well, how do I know what my pull strengths are? You know, customers, I think they make errors when they try not to penetrate the rooftop. You know, it's, it's very popular on a metal roof to use a, a clip and and just clip onto the roofing panel rather than penetrate through the roof. But the problem is these roofing panels are clipped together every 16 inches. And and technically 
uh, the, the design guides say that when you're clipping to the standing seam, because of the, the wind rating on these panels, you need to distribute that uplift force evenly across the panels. Otherwise, you can rip the panel off of the roof. And so in these, these clipping-based systems, they say you have to clip onto every seam as you go across the rooftop. And by the time you start buying that many clips, it's like you've, you've spent the money on, on you know, the, the, the railless racking system that goes across the entire roof. Um, you know, it doesn't really save you much money uh, because you might save just pennies on the rack and there's more labor. Now, we didn't have the option of doing a standing seam on Half Moon's rooftop because we had this corrugated rooftop. <clears throat> and so we had the option of, of doing this kind of fastener that would screw in above the channel or this kind of fastener uh, in support attachment that would screw in not on the channel. And, you know, I think, well, going up on the channel will get us out of our rainwater pathway. And so that'll be more waterproof. Uh, than going down to the channel. Well, the, the problem was, and you go on to the, the racking website, you know, they when we pulled up the, the load info for this bracket here, it was only rated for 16 gauge steel. And we saw from the construction documents that that metal purlin is 29 gauge steel. And so that, uh, you know, our, our roof is too weak for this attachment, you know, the fasteners would pull out. And that's generally true of trapezoidal metal rooftops is they're not strong enough for this kind of attachment. But you also can't use this kind of attachment, which means we have to use this kind of attachment. And so I'm, I'm bummed out because now on a metal roof with no flashing, I'm poking tons of holes into it. And, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that as a, a failure point. But, you know, all of these companies have technical support groups so that you can call them and ask them your engineering questions. You know, S5 has a, a great engineer, uh, Chris Stearns, and he was uh, able to explain to me how their mastic system works. And they put an ultra premium mastic. And he says, and, you know, the, the clip does provide a degree of flashing. And this mastic expands when you clamp down on it. And, you know, after and, and, you know, the the same the same fastener, it's like a neoprene washer on a on just a, a lag metal lag screw. That same fastener was used to attach the, the roof to the to the purlins without this mastic and without this flashing. So it actually was a, a more waterproof solution than how the, the roof was attached to begin with. And so you go to the, the racking manufacturer website, and just like I like Iron Ridge, I like working with uh, this uh, S5 company simply because they provide engineering data on their racking system that is useful to get a, a structural engineer to sign off on the project. So we see that for our uh, Versa bracket, you know, we have a, a wood purlin, a wood purlin or rafter, two inches vertical or horizontal. Well, in our case, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're horizontal that we'll be mounting onto. And so we, uh, we look at horizontal and we're using three fasteners. And after a safety factor of three is applied, I mean, my goodness, you know, we have all the pull strength and the rope in the, in the world, you know, the solar array is not coming out of that purlin, then it becomes an issue of how are the purlins attached to the, uh, rafters and generally what that ends up in is if you don't if you're already using some metal bracing uh, then you don't need to worry about it otherwise you may need to put in some additional reinforcement or at the very least get an engineering stamp now what I think is the most fascinating about this is that the the half inch surface board is rated for a 177 pound uh, uplift. And so that's the, the, are these decking based systems, can they actually withstand uh, the environmental conditions to go up? And so, so if we're just going into the decking, you know, can those decking based racking systems actually hold water? And for that, we go all the way back to our, our racking design. 
um, you know, all the way back to what we did yesterday, putting in our environmental data, choosing our XR10 system with our two foot, you know, this, this was the project where the engineer came back and said, you know, because this rooftop is so under engineered, you have to do two foot on center all the way across and evenly distribute the load across every uh, purlin. And so we see that by staying in zone one, our uplift force on each attachment point is 103 pounds. And we see they're rated after a safety factor of three is applied for 177 pounds. And so, yeah, that's, that's a firm attachment into that purlin. And if we enforce the purlins to the rafters and the rafters to the building wall, you know, that's a, a well-engineered system. So the, we have a question. is for a, a rooftop retrofit, is it a recommendation to always involve a structural engineer? And, you know, I, I usually leave it up to the client. Um, the way that the larger solar companies seem to be doing it is they look for uh, deviancies or deficiencies in the uh, during the site evaluation in the the roof truss, and if it looks, you know, uh, essentially if the if it's a two foot on center uh, pine truss and you're using hurricane clips to attach the truss to the building walls, uh, they're not going through the structural uh, review process. Uh, but if you're doing any other kind of building, like a metal rooftop or a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a building where the, the truss is not two foot on center. And so you need to go, you need, really need to plan on going into the, the decking, even if you're going into the rafters. If you're doing, if you're designing all the way to the edge of the roof and not staying into the interior of the roof, all of those scenarios, I think it's worthwhile to pitch the, the idea of the engineering stamp you have to remember the the tax credit applies to the engineering stamp, so you have an opportunity uh, to get thirty percent off. You know, so so if if it's a difference of adding you know seven hundred dollars in in cost to the client, uh, but getting an engineering stamp and providing something that no other company is doing, you know that is that is something that could only benefit your client down the road. You know, uh, right now the the insurance companies are just putting the array into an umbrella policy. Um, you know, the solar industry is still relatively new, and a lot of the early designs, just like you know, early fracking wells or the first model of any automobile, uh, the early solar array designs are not necessarily the best. You know, and it might not have been the installer's fault. It just might be that the products didn't exist at the time because the industry was brand new. Um, so I think that that going in with an engineering stamp is something that the insurance company will want to see. It is a good practice for uh, transferring project liability. It is you know if you don't if you don't understand the forces going on you know in the the rooftop, then yeah, it's it's worthwhile to get another set of eyes on it. Um, so we have a question, is there a maximum dollar amount on the 30% tax credit? And this is why the solar tax credit is so dangerous is that there is no cap on it. You know, actually George W. Bush brought in the solar tax credit in 2005. So, you know, Carter had it at 40% up to $10,000. And then it dropped down to 10% beyond that. That was actually a pretty good good one for the time. Um, Reagan canceled it. W brought it back at 30%, but it was capped at $2,000 at the residential level. And no one was doing commercial projects in 2005 anyway. Well, in 2008, as part of the TARP bailout, it got uncapped. So it's actually somewhat ironically, it was, it was George W. Bush who really initiated the solar era by uncapping the federal tax credit and allowing it to be 30% of total project value. And so, you know, there's far more subsidy dollars that go into big energy solar projects than go into the residential market 
even though the utilities portray it as a consumer solar versus centralized solar uh, a battle. So there's no cap on it, and that is kind of dangerous. There probably should be a cap on it that would make, you know, financial be responsible. Um, but no, you know, you can do a million dollar project. You can do a three million dollar battery. You know, there's rules like uh, with the batteries, they have to be charged by the solar uh, by the solar array. Uh, but the batteries will apply, the design fees will apply, the sales tax will apply. Um, as far as other racking issues, so here's like on, on a TPO rooftop. What you can see is just that corners of the solar array are anchored into the TPO roof. And uh, the, the roofing uh, contractor who installed the commercial roof actually came out uh, for one day on the project site, this is a 560 kilowatt project site. Uh, so they came out with a, a huge crew, uh, like 20 people for one day. And we only had a total, you know, there are less than, you know, on this kind of Walmart sized building, uh, there's less than 100 uh, penetrations. Uh, but you can see these, these ballasted supports, you know, far more ballasted supports than there are penetrations. The penetrations are just there to more to counter the tangential force to keep the array from sliding when it's being picked up by the wind, you know, but, but it's heavy enough and large enough to kind of stay down. And uh, on this job site, we have seen 90 mile an hour winds and the array stayed firmly in place. And yeah, these are just kind of conduit supports, but for, you know, an elevated racking structure. The alternate is to go with like a, you know, a concrete ballasted system, which is really from the, the, the satellite dish industry. And I really don't think the solar industry should be like borrowing a page from the direct TV business model of uh, doing projects as cheap as you can. Uh, you know, we're not talking about one satellite dish that, that sits in one spot on the rooftop where, you know, whereas these, concrete ballasted systems that are the most popular system you, know, you install these ballast trays and this graphic i think is a little misleading because they sit right on top of the roof deck and you they get filled in with concrete there's only like an inch of space between the roof deck and the bottom corner of that solar module so it's at a, a higher temperature and it's harder uh, for maintenance. It's harder to clean if you get leaves and debris on the array. Um, but the problem is this kind of elevated racking structure costs more uh, and does require multiple contractors. And, uh, you know, maybe your solar outfits just don't want to deal with multiple contractors. And that might be why you have to have more of a general construction manager come in and take charge of the project. You know, there's still going to be room on the project for, for the guy who knows everything about solar. That's not what I'm saying, but, you know, it, it might be that, you know, if the, the value of the solar subsidies uh, do get taken out by tax reform, that we have to change up our business model to get the arrays out of the ground. I'm not too pessimistic, though. It's the, the batteries are, are changing everything for commercial solar. It's actually growing the market. So we could actually see these subsidies get eliminated and still see growth in the commercial flat roof market. We'll get into that after the break. Um, let's see. So some experimental things I've picked up on, uh, you know, decking based racking systems combined with reinforcing the decking to the, the roof truss may be the best way to go in uh, hurricane zones so that, you know, you, you, super reinforce the, the entire roof to the, you know, basically incorporate the roof into the building. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. So what we're going to do now is, is we're, we're an hour and a half into the program. We're going to take a, a 15 minute break and when we come back. We're going to do uh, a ground mount case study and then kind of get into more of a, a battery based uh, discussion. So let's take 15 minutes. Uh, it is uh, one, I want to call it 135 now. We'll pick back up at about 10 till.
We're going to pick back up in just a minute. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's go ahead and just dive right in. So, uh, I guess last year in April of 2016, we did a, a residential ground mount on the uh, Half Moon property, and uh, the the goal was the the original task was well, we want to go off grid, uh, but we had a, a fifteen thousand dollar project budget, and that's just too little. Uh, to go off grid. Uh, I recently commissioned an off grid home and it's been uh, running along no problem. But then again, this is the easiest time of year. Uh, I'm just a little concerned because they're using construct powering their construction with it and uh, it's lead acid batteries. So I don't really don't really like that. I've t given them, you know, instruction to use their heavy tools on uh, on the generator. So I hope they follow that advice. Uh, but on this project, you know, that, that residential off-grid project was a $80,000 project on very slim margins. You know, I kind of gave them a discount because, you know, I'd never done a design of that magnitude before for off-grid. Um, so when you're looking at about 80 grand to go off-grid, you know, that customer was building a new home. It would have cost him $30,000 just to bring the power out to his property. So he'd rather, you know, he already knew he was going to do solar, and part of that cost was the, was the solar array. <clears throat> yeah. So what we wanted to do with this project was just how much solar can we do for fifteen thousand dollars? And in this one, we chose to do a ground mount rather than put it on the roof uh, because there's plenty of real estate available. And so one one thing that we see in solar is this conception that ground mounts are expensive, but then again, almost all utility scale projects are ground mounts. You know, there's there's very few utility collaborations where they take a, a rooftop and build a, a utility type solar farm in size on a series of rooftops. Very few collaborations like that. Um you know, generally the, the cheapest solution is to, to do pile driving and put the modules in a field. So how can ground mounts be expensive if at the largest, you know, project size with the biggest budgets, that's what they do? You know, the problem with residential ground mounting was that the, the access to good quality ground mount product uh, in the residential market was just not available. You know, you were either building a cheap system out of Unistrut and pouring your own concrete uh, little pedestals uh, and, and building a, a Unistrut base and putting a roof mount racking system on top of that. Or you were building a pole mount system and putting the whole solar array up on one pole, which is a lot more expensive than uh, kind of building a, a scaffolding type array. A deeper foundation, heavier pipe. Uh, you know that you know, that gets into uh, you know project logistics when your your schedule 80 13 foot pole weighs 800 pounds and you're trying to do a project with you know two or three people. Uh, you know that's you know so the logistics of that are hard and you don't do that at the utility scale. The utility scale is is common this pile driven system. You know, otherwise your your residential roof mount systems they kind of build a a scaffold and then you just have a lot of of kind of pedestals and then you get weeds underneath the array and they they grow up and make the array hard to maintain. Now at the utility scale, they if they're not doing a tracking array, uh, they're doing just a fixed in place array and 
the residential market just did not have access to this product. But now your utility scale racking companies are kitting out their products into the residential market. So you can buy uh, utility scale type racking at very reasonable prices uh, to which the, you know, the, the way I see it is I, I hate being up on a rooftop. You know, rooftops are, are not fun construction sites. But when you're working outdoors on the ground and it's a nice day outside and you're building a solar array, you know, that's a that's a fun day at the office. That's something you, you get excited about. So I would gladly, you know, the, the slight price difference, you know, when you look at what is the price difference between a ground mount and a, a roof mount solar array, you know, basically what you have is the, you know, with a roof mount solar array, you're still installing these east-west rails. And you're also installing the attachment points, which kind of comprise, you know, an equivalent material of these braces. And so really the, the price of a, the cost difference between a ground mount and a roof mount is the cost to rent, you know, a bobcat with an extension bit so that you can drill out a, a two and a half uh, foot hole in the ground that goes about seven feet and uh and and then you you know the the pile you know the racking system itself costs about 30 cents a watt plus the concrete pour which is not that expensive now you know if you if you mix your own concrete that that can be quite a challenge uh because the the foundations we're talking about like 18 yards of of concrete uh for a a 10 kilowatt array uh I, I believe so. Uh, I don't know. It's to me, yeah. The ground mount, you do have to rent the bobcat. You do have to coordinate the concrete pour. On the other hand, on a residential rooftop, there's a lot more liability. You know, are you going to rent a lift to lift the material up to the rooftop, or instead, are you going to have some guy schlepping, you know, the material up and down a ladder? You know, so if you're renting a lift anyway, you know, you might as well rent a bobcat and be on the ground. That's no cost difference. And, you know, really the cost difference comes down if you're using, if you're going into the project, assuming that you will be using heavy equipment, whether or not it's a residential or a commercial or residential ground mount or a residential two-story roof mount. You know, at, at that point, you know, one story roof mounts are fun, too. You know, that's not very high up. You know, it's easy to get up and down the job site. You know, you if you use a lift on the one story, it's you can it's cheaper. The lift is not as uh, robust and it you can just lift the whole pallet up and offload them. And it's a, a nice time. Um, so it's nice to use and have and, and budget for some heavy equipment when you're installing. Not all installers do, but. Uh, it, it does help out. And then when you get into a ground mount, they can deliver the bobcat and the trencher. So we dug a trench back to our, our point of interconnection right here. They can deliver a bobcat and a trencher and all the equipment in one shipment. So it's like the day of the project, the equipment shows up. You have a guy get to work on the trench, another guy getting to work on, on the augers. And then uh, you get the concrete truck there in the afternoon, pour the concrete, put the piles in your electricians working on the inverter wall and the next day you put the modules on wire everything up and commission that's a two day long install uh, and all of this stuff is kitted out and so the the real cost difference is you're ordering concrete but you're also not having to deal with the hassle of getting up and down on the rooftop so ground mounts do at the residential level cost slightly more but we're talking about five to ten cents a watt we're not talking you know some installers think that a ground mount costs a dollar a watt more to install and they're just you know generally not very experienced with just general contracting uh and maybe haven't revisited the market you know they might be thinking about those pole mount projects which are more expensive a double axis tracker absolutely is more expensive uh are double axis trackings worthwhile? You know, maybe if you're off grid, it is because if you're double axis tracking, you don't need as large of a battery bank. All this stuff depends on the, the design. 
Uh, one kind of fun thing we wanted to try out on the, the Half Moon project was to uh, use a wire technique called leapfrogging. Uh, this is a wire technique that is specific to 72 cell modules. So the question is, can you mount a module in landscape or portrait? And the answer is yes, these, these cables that come off the back of the, the solar module can stretch so that they can plug in uh, in either orientation, whether it's portrait or landscape. Uh, now, a 72 cell module is taller than a 60 cell module. And while you would, you know, the recommendation is to use 60 cell modules uh, on the rooftop, um, the, the extra length on a 72 cell module means that these cables are just, you know, slightly longer than on the 60 cell modules, but 60 cell modules and 72 cell modules are the same width. And so the, the reason I mentioned this is you get a little bit more cable length on the 72 cell modules. And in the utility scale arena, you know, they've realized that, hey, if I'm up on the rooftop, I'm clicking my modules together, usually <laughs> like this, positive, negative, positive, negative. Uh, and I get all this extra cable that I'm not really using, just kind of bundled up uh, together. Whereas if I'm on the ground and I'm using 72 cell modules, I have enough cable length that instead of plugging into my next door neighbor, I'm going every other module and then all the way back. And so the difference is if I, um, if I do the residential rooftop method, you know, clicking the modules in to their next door neighbors as you move along, you get to the last module on the circuit and you build a, a custom uh, MC4 connector and bring it back home. Uh, and then you start at the beginning of the circuit and you build your, you know, your negative back home. But then at the utility scale, if you can implement on the ground mount project, this kind of leapfrogging method, your circuit just starts and stops, you know, in, in relatively the exact same place. So it's a little bit better organized and on a tracking array they might have this circuit be one arm of the tracker and then the other circuit be the other arm of the tracker and and uh you know have some some symmetrical blocks going on which you know lend them well to the utility style tracking designs that's just kind of a, a advanced note but you know, what i think was neat is i had never done this before i was like well how do i figure out if my 72 cell module can actually have the, the cable link that's long enough so that this would work. And even that dimension of how long the cable whip is coming off the back of the solar module, you can find on a solar module spec sheet. So solar module spec sheets are very well detailed, at least by your, your top quality manufacturers. And so here's our solar array. Uh, we actually couldn't do the leapfrogging. Uh, my mistake was I ordered two solar kits and I should have combined them. And, you know, originally I thought, well, we can we can have this space in here to walk between the arrays. But then that would make the wiring a little too complicated. And so anyway, we just had this little gap and um, could have probably brought the project cost down by another, I don't know, hundred dollars or so if we had had designed it as one contiguous array. Uh, we also threw down some extra conductors along this trench uh, you know, for system expansion. Because if they went fully off grid, they would need to expand the sol another section here and another section here. And so we just wanted to, they're, they're pouring a concrete pad over this later and we don't want to have to rerun those conductors. So we threw some conductors down. It actually was just the solar cable. The solar cable is, is rated for uh, direct exposure, not direct exposure, but exposure to sunlight. So it can be outside of a conduit uh, if it's not inside of a building um, or on a building. Um, and then we have uh, uh, our solar cable. It's rated for direct burial. So we just threw it straight into the ground. I've done this a few times and, and not had problems with it. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, a sandy soil, so direct barrel cable goes right in. Um, 
and we just ran our, our three circuits of modules back to the three circuit tracking uh, string inverter. And so here we have our, our uh, 300 watt 72 cell solar module and our six kilowatt string inverter in our commercial solar design software. And we got a uh, string one, string two, string three, and we're just putting them eight modules each. This was really no reason not to, you know, there's no reason to have them be different. And so we, our first circuit is in on one side. Our second circuit is on the other side. Our third circuit is here. You know, this was the one line diagram that we submitted to the utility. You know, they had never heard, you know, our, our electrical contractor had never done solar before, but you know, you send him this document, he looks at it and says, okay, well, as long as you can answer my questions, I can, I can put this together for you. You know, you make solar look like something that's, you know, put it in their terms, you know, submit it to the contracting office. You know, as long as you your documents look professional, the the permits usually go a lot better than if you're, uh, you know, kind of hand drawing them. Uh, let's see. This was our bill of material. Uh, so we actually put this is from the from this is all of this is calculated just based off you know telling them what I'm going to do, what cable types I'm going to do. Uh, so we, as one of the slides, we have the actual prices. So this is a little out of date now. This is as of 2016. Uh, but just, you know, I wanted to, to back up the material list with the total cost. It was $11,200. Now we actually, the pallet was 25 modules and the design was only for 24. So, you know, they just got a bonus module to play around with, or, uh, you know, if you, take it off site you can play around with it but you know regardless you know we had we spent 11,200 on material the array was 24 modules 310 watt modules that came out to be $1.50 a watt in cost i think back then the solar modules were around 75 cents a watt now they're uh, you know 13 cents a watt cheaper then we add our, our cost of concrete, our uh, electrician uh, who helped, who pulled the permit and supplied, you know, basically a master electrician and a foreman for two and a half days. Uh, our heavy equipment rental, you know, I cut Half Moon a sweetheart deal. They actually booked some classes for me up in the area. So it's just kind of, uh, you know, this was the design fees, but I did travel to site to do this. Now, I don't think you would need you know, a uh, uh, expert on site more than once, you know, just to get the electricians confident that, you know, they do have the hand skills to do this stuff. But like I found, you know, on that project site, you know, the electrician put in, you know, a 18 inch junction box. And I was like, why is it so big? You know, we could just do a, a 12 inch and still have plenty of room to work around in. He says, no, you know, there's, there's a part of national electric code involving capacity fill of uh, junction boxes. And with this large conduit size and this large cable size, we got to go into an 18 inch box instead. You know, it's that, that master electrician who knows everything about code. You know, he's really the guy who is the, you know, going to be there to catch you. You know, the electrical inspectors, you know, I, lo I love it when an electrical inspector plays close attention to the design because, you know, it's the, the guys who know about electricity, as long as they're looking at a plan set so they can that they can understand, you know, it's the hand skills involved are not that difficult. So our our it's it's called PV cable or PV wire. It's a, a special order single conductor cable with a really robust jacket. You know, you don't have to use it, uh, but it's it's a good idea to just to have that extra insulation when you're outside of conduit. Now, if I'm going into conduit in a, a dry environment, then I'm not going to use PV cable because the, the extra insulator thickness is unnecessary and, and traps more heat. Uh, bare copper, wire management clips, uh, the MC4 connectors, the tap connector. I always put lightning arresters on it to prevent nearby lightning strikes surging up and, and frying the inverter. Uh, you can put them on the DC side as well. So if the array gets struck by lightning, it protects the inverter. Uh, 
I haven't seen a, a solar array get struck by lightning, but I have seen uh, uh, 480. Uh, actually, this was the coming. Yeah, so this was the uh, the the utility distribution circuit voltage uh, feeder conductor hit the side of a metal building while they were uh, tapping it on to the transformer, and it it you know our array was there grounded. And but we still have what twenty thousand volts surge through the the side of the building. Uh, that wasn't very good. But you know what happened was the MC4 connectors on two circuits exploded and basically vaporized. And we we you know this would void the module warranty. But you know we cut the MC4 connectors off the module, spliced new MC4 connectors on, and plugged them in, and the modules you know, cleared that voltage just fine. Maybe it didn't get to them. Maybe it went to ground before that point. Uh, so anyway, I well, what I'm trying to say is the lightning arresters are installed to protect the inverter system, not necessarily to protect the, the solar array itself. Uh, uh, knife switch disconnect is a common utility requirement. I usually try and talk the utility out of it because it's just often it's unnecessary. I would rather land my system on a, a service panel or a breaker panel anyway, and that's better set up for further system expansion down the road for whatever comes your way, batteries or what have you. Um, so, you know, the, the fused AC knife switch is the cheapest option if your inverter does not have an AC disconnect and you only have one inverter, um, so it's just one fuse, no problem. But that's just a, you know, that's kind of an antiquated system design, but the knife switch requirement still remains in effect to this day by lo many, lo most local jurisdictions. Concrete junction box uh, came out, total project cost came out to, uh, you know, 227 a watt and that was back in May 2016 so this is kind of a, a do-it-yourself budget while still having experts design the system and install the system uh, ground mount project whereas many solar installers to this day will tell you ground mounts cost four or five dollars a watt now it might be that a general contractor can do the project a little bit better with their knowledge of heavy equipment use uh, a one-line diagram for a battery-based system, you know, Half Moon expressed the desire to go off-grid in the future. So we went with a, a, an, an inverter that, while it was not a battery inverter, it had a very good system for adding batteries down the road. So, you know, this current inverter, it actually has a, a secure power supply. This is an outlet that, during a power outage, you can just plug into. And what we should have done on this project is actually taken this outlet and moved it on into the kitchen uh, on the other side of this wall so that when there was a power outage, they could just plug in next to the kitchen sink and still use uh, an outlet's worth of power um, without batteries. So it has a, a separately derived output circuit that only comes on during a grid outage. Uh, to draw a minimum amount of current through the inverter without batteries. It's pretty cool, pretty advanced. Whether or not that's a gimmick, you know, whether or not that customer should actually be doing a battery system, that's a subject of debate. You know, I think it makes economic sense to do the bare minimum today and kind of ride out the battery wave, uh, especially with the recent changes uh, in tax reform to the tax treatment of the credit. Um, we have... You know, down the road, what we'll do is we'll just install a separate inverter for the battery system. And because we're using an SMA batteryless inverter, and SMA has a battery inverter, the two inverters can communicate together in an intelligent manner. And most of you are going to want that. Most of you are going to want to use the same manufacturer for uh, the battery and the solar array because instead of powering down the array when the batteries are full, it can keep the solar array on but throttle back the solar array output. 
And so whatever the building load is, it's still running off the solar array. If the battery inverter and the solar array inverter cannot communicate, and so that would be if you installed a solar array a few years ago, and then maybe your inverter manufacturer went out of business. Um, and that would be like a Sun Edison solar lease. You know, you may have an in-phase microinverter up on your rooftop, but Sun Edison might control the communication system. And so now you have kind of microinverters that work, but you can't communicate with them to get them to work in sync with a battery inverter. So what would happen if you took a battery inverter that could not communicate with a solar array and, in, and not have them be separately derived, but have them be on the same circuit? Well, what would happen is the, the battery inverter could turn the solar array on. And so this is allowable, but you have to have a disconnect switch from the grid so you don't backfeed the grid. And the battery inverter will... Uh, have enough power to turn the solar array on. The solar array, when the sun's up, you know, starts providing power to the load, and then it fills the batteries up. And the, the concern is, well, what happens when the batteries are full and the solar array is still at full power? Well, just like if there's a problem with the grid, it changes the frequency of the grid, and that frequency is picked up by the batteryless inverter, and it turns the inverter off. If the batteries are full, the, the batteryless inverter will send a frequency through the grid and turn the solar array off, and the, the array will turn off for five minutes, and that'll drain the batteries down, and then the array will turn back on, and the batteries will fill up, and you know it'll happen over and over and over again. You know, that's called hard slamming. And that's, uh, you know, if, if you have two inverters of different manufacturers, uh, that are solar and batteries fighting each other, they actually can do this in a controlled manner that is code compliant and you won't see uh, a quality signal in your electricity difference because the battery inverter is still kind of in, in, in charge of everything. It gets more complicated when you have two battery inverters of, of different manufacturers who both think they're in charge because they can fight with each other. And generally, that's not a supported feature by the mainstream battery inverter companies. Uh, a more common scenario is, you know, where you have a generator. And nowadays, you can, you can buy generators that are variable speed generators that will only output based on what the load is. And so as long as your solar array is smaller than your base load, you can have a solar array reduce the, uh, the gas consumption on your generator. You don't need to have them be separately derived. But there still are design issues. Uh, you know, If you are going to have a solar array that's larger than your base load, then you would also need to add a battery onto that and program more of a control system. So back to the half moon array, the, the ground conductors are coming up here. Here's our extra uh, for expansion down the road. We just kind of uh, put them in a box and buried them. Uh, going up into the inverter, secure power supply, coming into the AC disconnect. Here's our lightning arrestor that protects surges up the AC side. Uh, then we go into our line side tap that's inside this box. We have our utility uh, bottom fed service entrance conductors. This is a completely separate electric service for an independent heat pump. So that's really not part of the project. You know, this is the customer's meter. And so what happens is we're interconnecting the solar array you know, this is where the customer's power goes into the, their building, goes into their, their service panel that's in the basement of their home. And so we're not connecting onto the customer's service panel. The service panel's inside the building. We're connecting between the service panel and the customer meter. And so we output electricity and it just, you know, it intercepts here. And whatever load is not sucked in by the service panel uh, gets backfed into the grid. Uh, so one thing we did that saved us some money is we we bought 72 cell modules instead of 60 cell modules because we had a, a equivalent price per watt on either one. But by going with the 72 cell option, 
uh, it, it saved us about two cents a watt on our racking because it, it made more the it only increased our racking budget by forty dollars, but we were able to fit twenty percent more uh, modules onto that same uh, frame. We also eliminated the combiner box. This was a ground mount array. We just ran the circuits all the way back to the string inverter because, uh, you know, even though we mounted the inverter on the home, so technically a hard inspector would fail us for that. Yeah, you know, it's a ground mount array. If it's arc faulting, you know, it, it, it should be okay. Um, and so we, we fused the conductors back at the inverter rather than at the array. It's within line of sight. But I wouldn't do that that way. I'd still recommend, even if you don't have to put uh, some kind of fuse box out at the ground mount site per code, I would still recommend doing it because it's just nice to have a, some form of disconnect out there. Uh, the, the skip stepping was really more of a, of a style points exercise. It, it, uh, we didn't end up doing it, but it would have only saved us about 20 bucks. So the one thing it would have done, though, is, is maybe improve the system efficiency by a tenth of a percent because we wouldn't have had the length of the home run cable. Uh, it wouldn't have been so long. Uh, you know, basically, you would be mitigating the voltage drop along this line here. The voltage drop would then be shortened by the length of the array, and that 40 less feet, that's, that's something. Um, and so you look at our 227 a watt with the 30% tax credit. They have a net metering rate at 13 cents. Uh, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, it's about 1.36 kilowatt hours per year. And so that resulted in a, a nine-year simple payback. And so, no, two, two meters were not required by the utility. There was no utility incentive involved in this. Usually when two meters are required by the utility, it's because there's an incentive program, which may or may not be a valuable incentive program. It just might be a special program that the utility does um, in exchange for net metering or something like that. So in, in Mississippi, where I'm at in the TVA region, there's no requirement for net metering, uh, but the TVA will buy your outflowed electricity. And it's actually not your outflow. They'll, they'll connect the solar array to uh, directly to the grid and buy and say, you can't connect the solar array to your home to participate in this program, but we'll buy all of the electricity at retail price. And it's kind of, it's kind of weird because it, it means you can't really get any value out of batteries, but uh, that's their program. And we have two meters because they have to track it the same way they track everything else. So if the utility has a special solar program, that's when you really have two meters. Um, are there any smart meters with software to analyze power production from the solar array? So yes, you know, the, the meter will only be able to tell the difference between inflow and outflow. So uh, this is actually about uh, two years later, uh, I got a call from one of the owners of Half Moon and they're like, well, you know, our, our, we got our electric bill and we're looking at the, the outflow, and I have the solar estimate, and it's only about 10% what the solar estimate said. And so the utility is purchasing this many kilowatt hours, and, and you said it should be producing 10 times the amount. And so the economics, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to be a, a short-term payback. It looks like it's going to be a decades-long payback. So what's going on here? And, you know, the utility without that second meter was only tracking the outflow. So if you just have one meter, it's not going to also be able to tell you what the, the inverter does. However, if you're into the, like, tech community, you know, open source software, GitHub, there are many of the digital meters emit a radio frequency. And depending on your meter type, there are hardwares that you can buy to pick up on that frequency and get a display of when you are outflowing or inflowing. And there's also similar codes for Wi-Fi inverters 
where instead of relying on the uh, inverter monitoring system platform, you can intercept that data and pull it into your own internal software. So there are hardware options for building your own monitoring system without using the utility meter or, int or the opposite, integrating into the utility meter, which is much more valuable. And your utility meter may have data coming out of it that you can grab into today. Um, you know, it's the same way that the, the, the utility collects that data. So, you know, it, it depends on your meter, though. You know, every, every state gets to set their own utility policy, their utility pricing. There's not, you know, much federal overriding structure of electricity pricing. And um, so it's we don't have national. <laughs> it's not as much of a national standard as perhaps they can do in other smaller countries. All right, so the number one failure point I see are MC4 connectors. So this is the field-built home run connector, where basically you have the single-strand solar cable, and you uh, you know you remove the wire, strip the wire, then you have this kind of housing uh, that gets crimped around the cable. Now, if possible, you should buy the MC4 crimp tool. And MC4 is both a brand and a standard. So, you know, ironically, some of the other companies that are not the MC4 company make higher quality MC4 connectors than the MC4 brand does. But the MC4 brand was one of the, the first to market. So they open sourced their platform. Uh, the solar industry rallied behind it. And it's not the best connector in the world. Um, like this MC4 um connector here that crimps around this conductor sometimes it comes in a u shape and sometimes it comes in a complete circle and the u shape can is if you don't have the mc4 tool the u shape if you try to crimp it with like a pair of vice grips or uh uh you know a coaxial cable crimp or something like that it, it can slide off and that will that will cause a fault um you can get a better MC4 connector that has a circular housing and the vice grips work just fine in my experience, but that's not the professional way to do it. You know, the problem is this MC4 tool, it costs like 600 bucks. So, you know, unless you're installing solar on a regular basis, you're not going to go and buy that one tool for the job. You know, if you, if you are smart, you could buy it and then probably easily resell it. Um, and, and make sure that your your work is done in a workmanlike manner. Um, but it's a very expensive tool. Now, you can find $40 knockoffs on Amazon, uh, but that is exactly what they are. They're, you know, I bought one for the Half Moon Project, and it was no better than a pair of vice grips, and in some ways worse. So, um, you know, you kind of get what you pay for on the, the crimping tools. You know, they, they have to be pretty precise instruments, strong. And so that's kind of a, the specialty material. You have a, a MC4 crimping tool, MC4 connectors, and a spool of what's called solar cable or PV wire. That's a single strand uh, copper cable with a, a very robust outer jacket for outdoor use, for outside the conduit use for the most part. Okay, so... Um, you know, we do teach a class on National Electric Code, but I'm going to go through some of the uh, kind of the, the lessons learned. Uh, you know, it, it's you're allowed to put your transition boxes underneath the solar array. Uh, you know, they're not the, the primary disconnect. They're not the primary overcurrent device in that circuit. So they just have to be accessible. They don't have to be readily accessible. I like locating that stuff under the solar array. You don't have to, but um, there are transition boxes that are that are intended to be used in the solar industry that look a lot better than just buying a, a junction box from Home Depot. Um, you know, when you pass into the attic, you need to seal that conduit. You know, just the the temperature difference between the uh, the outdoors and the indoors. Uh, can cause humidity to condensate into that conduit, and then it can just drip down all the way back to your inverter. 
Um, it can get tight in your electrical room where you're mounting the inverter. You know, it's nice to have the inverter in a conditioned space, but sometimes you just don't have the space for it. Uh, especially the, the battery inverters are still rather large, kind of like the, the original solar inverters that would be, you know, 80 pounds and two and a half feet wide, three feet tall. Uh, so the battery inverters are still kind of large and clunky, which I like. You know, that means they're very easy to wire, but uh, they do take up space. And there's there's code rules of clearance requirements that, that essentially boil down to, um, you know, where you have electrical wiring, you can't have other services like plumbing or, or gas lines uh, in that, that space. And there's certain offset requirements that essentially boil down to making the space safe to work in. And that includes if you have some electrical equipment up here and some electrical equipment down here, there's even a, a, a depth requirement of only about six inches offset that you're allowed to do. So it's very easy to get into a, a, a code violation when it actually comes to hanging the stuff on the wall. Um, one of the more bait, so here's the, the Half Moon uh, commercial site. And this is the closet where their wiring is in. And, you know, it's, we can see it's, it's not done in a, a workmanlike air, you know, in manner. Uh, the, the six foot high space requirement for this uh, air conditioner duct, you know, that's right on the line. Um, you know, they're, they're using the area for storage and that's not allowed. Uh, so there's a, a variety of things that if I bring in, the inspector into this room there's a variety of things that could go wrong with the inspection and the half moon commercial project was the the first uh, commercial solar array in Eau Claire and Eau Claire is where Excel Energy is headquartered and so you know I not only am I getting the the head of the Wisconsin uh, solar rebate program uh, out we're also getting the you know, the, the inspector of the city and perhaps the, the head of the Eau Claire Renewable Energy Department coming on to, to take a look. And and the last thing I want to do is march everybody into this uh, supply room electrical closet uh, on commissioning. And so what I want to do is I want to keep the, the interconnection outside the building, you know, make it nice and neat. And you, know, you just walk around back, turn the array on and everybody you know, shakes hands and goes about their day. And so this is, we have the two service panels and this is where they're located. And so my instruction to the electrical contractor was, well, look, you know, we don't want to have to be powering down and powering up the, the half moon facility uh, in an uncontrollable manner when depending on our construction schedule and the utility schedule. So why don't we get out on a Saturday before the construction project begins, and and this is where we have our half our utility main service meter going into two service panels that are hitting this wall. What we want to do is take off one of these entry boxes and put in a junction box and put in a disconnect. And you know we looked at this side and we have this gas line and this side we have this air conditioner unit, so we had to be you know aware of those clearances. We opted for the right hand side. We put in the junction box, we put in the disconnect, we put in the service panel where our micro inverter circuits were landing, and then we just went straight up into the attic and uh, ran our, our cables there. We actually used micro inverters on this project, even though the micro inverters have those rooftop issues and the micro inverters have, um, you know, they're more expensive. What we wanted to do was use Half Moon's electrical contractor who was doing the work on the rest of the building do the install as well. And by using the microinverters, that allowed us to be on alternating current in the attic. You know, direct current has to be in, in conduit. You know, it doesn't have to be in conduit. It has to be enclosed in metal. So you could use metal sheathed cable for your direct current circuits or you run metal conduit through the attic, but with AC, you can be in Romex. So we just ran Romex through the attic. It was a very quick install, uh, worked out real well. 
But the Saturday before the project, we went and we installed the junction box because literally, you know, the electrician shows up, the, the, the power company comes out, they power the building down. He pulls the conductors out of this box and out of this box, cuts off the LB, mounts the junction box, puts the conductors back in and closes the lid. Because that means we're all ready to commission the array on commissioning day. All that we have to do is open up this junction box, cut the conductors, peel them back, and put them into our tap connector. We used to use a, a piercing insulated tap connector that you would just crank down and bite into the conductors. So that was, you know, that was even a, a one-minute commission. So the building really only lost power for, you know, as little as a minute during the work day. Um, but from going around the country and, and talking about these things, I run into more electricians who recommend kind of staying away from them and using a regular tap than electricians who support them by a, a large degree. So I've kind of moved back to the traditional tap connectors inside these boxes. So here we have our, our line side tap between the meter and the service panel. You know, or if you just had a microinverter circuit, you could do a, a meter disconnect combo box and land your microinverters onto the, the service load center. Um, that's, you know, that, that results in a very nice and neat looking array. Um, I like doing this kind of meter panel combo set because having extra breaker slots available, you know, you might need those in the future. You might want to put battery additional battery inverters, additional solar inverters, maybe a, a capacitor down the road to help manage your uh, surges. Who knows? You know, or you participate in a solar incentive program and you get a second meter and then the utility requires a knife switch disconnect, even though that has no basis in uh, or no requirement in National Electric Code for a knife switch disconnect. You know, a breaker would meet the same requirement but the utility requires a knife switch disconnect because that's the way they do it. And then we have a, a string inverter mounted on the side of the wall instead of the micro inverters up on the rooftop. And then they're using a, you know, flex conduit and it, it just doesn't look as good or clean as, you know, what you might prefer, depending on aesthetic value. Um, because in the, the, TVA region, we, we establish brand new electrical services for, for solar projects on, at the commercial level. Uh, you know, we get into providing the meter and meter box. Generally, there's a, a ring style or a ringless style. The ringless have a little tab at the bottom versus the ring style. The tab is up at the meter base. That's pretty much the only thing you do. But if you're establishing a brand new electric service, generally you'll you'll spec out the, the meter box and, and have to check with the utility so that they you know if it's a ring or a ringless. And then you put the, the pole up with this little crow's head and, and run the cables, enough cable to come up here. And the utility will come around and they'll hang a transformer, establish the new electric service off the power lines, come across, and then tap on to the uh, uh, cables inside or right close to this weather head. You, know, you have to know your electric service. You know, you, you're, you will get a different inverter for every different electric service type. So whether that's uh, three phase delta or three phase Y, you know, 480 versus 208, it actually can be kind of hard to find a 208Y inverter uh, you might find yourself using, uh, you know, multiple string inverters across two phases instead. Uh, you know, you get little grounding washers that bite into the module frame to connect the modules to the racking. Uh, you know, one, you know, recently I, on that, that microinverter array where we did the array expansion, we opened up the junction box and a bunch of water fell out. And I looked at Nick and I was like, Nick, have you ever seen this happen before? And he's like, yeah, you know, last time I opened up the box, a bunch of water fell out. And what we did was we didn't seal the, the conduit that was an underground connection going into the box. And so the box, it was shaded 
on the north side of the building, but it still was enough to get humidity to come up that conduit and condensate and form rain. You know, it's kind of ironic, but it's code compliant to take a weatherproof box and then drill a wheat hole into it to get that water to drain out of the bottom of the box. But it's also a code requirement to seal your uh, conduit when they pass from, uh, you know, one one temperature differential to another. Uh, DC circuits need to be run inside metal raceways, uh, but that includes metal, metal clad cable. And I have talked to solar installers who say, yeah, we do metal clad cable all the time because that allows us to do internal wire runs in tight places. Uh, conduit fill, this kind of threw me when I got into the industry. Uh, the, you know, I, I felt, well, if, if I'm only filling up 40% of the conduit, that means it's 60% empty. So if I don't really pay much attention to this item, you know, what's the worst that can happen is that it's half, you know, 45% full. Well, it turns out that when you fill conduit with cable and you get more than 40% full, you can't pull it through the bins. It, it twists up and, and seizes. So it's always better where you can to oversize the conduit. You know, we, we've talked about wire upsizing yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, batteries are <laughs> surging. So when I got into the solar industry in 2008, there were records, you know, the solar industry was growing at 100%, 200%, 300% a year. You know, now it's more like 20% a year, sometimes a, a little bit less. You know, this year and next year, the market may contract, and that's really will be contractions on the utility scale. Then again, the technology is exceeding the, the price benchmark goals so that, you know, the contractions may, it, you know, it may, you know, the solar market, the long term trend is continued growth. But in terms of explosive growth, the battery market is exploding. You know, comparing quarter one storage capacity is just about six months ago, chemical storage overtook mechanical storage in terms of the, the federal energy storage uh, projects. So there's compressed air projects and rail car projects and uh, pumped hydro dam. You know, they run the dam in reverse projects. Well, now bat grid connected batteries have overtaken mechanical storage. And so this is actually causing a, a very interesting thing to happen. So I want to show you um, show you the this is out in mississippi so this is our you know this is not our city electric grid this is when you get out into the county and there's a lot of farms and manufacturing centers and stuff out here in mississippi and mississippi has a low cost of electricity there's there's if if anything the utility policies are uh not as generous as uh, other states and utilities so you really have to to watch your pricing uh, to make the projects cost effective and uh, we get to our you know we pay about 11 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity at the residential level but you get into the commercial power service and you get into the 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 high-end customers who use the the most amount of power and what we can see is there you know we get into our loads greater than one megawatt so our industrial customers they're actually buying their electricity not for 11 cents, but they're buying their electricity for six cents a kilowatt hour or seven cents a kilowatt hour. So it's some of the cheapest electricity in the country. And that makes solar very difficult. You know, it's, their average might be 11 or 12 cents, but the energy charge on the bill is seven. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's for your industrial customers. I actually didn't realize it was that high. I thought it was closer to four cents. And so the, the, the you know, avoided cost rate in Mississippi is two cents. 
You, know, you just can't make projects work at two cents in the U.S. right now. Uh, you can in Mexico. They don't have the import tariffs. Uh, but the what surprised me about the the TVA. So I'm sitting here in a state where there's like it's it's far behind the the leading states for solar. But you know I'd say the bottom 30 states are all of you know 30 out of 50 states in the U.S. are much further behind. And there's really only four states that are ahead, and that's states that you know way over subsidize the industry. Yeah, you know, so we're still seeing, you know, waiting for, you know, mainstream adoption of solar and solar to get more cost effective. And I'm sitting in a state that, you know, where if you don't get net metering, you know, if you if you want to use the system as a battery backup and connect it into your service panel, then you don't get net metering in the TVA. And Mississippi Power's uh, net metering is they'll buy your electricity at at seven cents instead of retail price, you know, it's better than nothing. Um, but we have our industrial customers at a $18, $19 kilowatt demand charge. And that's some of the, uh, I, I, I read a PowerPoint presentation recently that referenced me to this recently released data. I'll put it into the, the chat box, but I've been trying to find data like this for years. And now NREL finally uh, finally did it. Uh, the the Energy Information Agency tracks rate structures and the cost of electricity, but they don't drill down to demand charge data. And so finally, National Renewable Energy Labs, as of this month, or I guess we're in December now, <laughs> so one month ago they released this data, and it's a a summary of all the demand charges in the country and uh, you know it turns out that my utility is in the top three percent of demand charges in the whole country and it used to be that solar couldn't do anything about the demand charges because you know what we would have is the the solar array would turn on in the morning reach a peak at high noon and turn off in the evening and here in dark blue is what the building's load is normally without solar or batteries. But what would happen is, um, you know, maybe a, a cloud would pass over the array during this time. And so the building demand would spike back up. And so we would have all this demand, peak demand electricity being produced on the top of the building. But one cloud in the sky could rain on that customer's parade because the peak demand charge is the maximum customer demand over the entire month. So you take the hottest day of the month and you get one cloud in the sky and it, it ruins all of your economics for demand savings. And, and furthermore, a lot of businesses, it's not just that they're, they have a peak in the middle of the day, but they'll also see a morning peak when everyone's showing up for work and then you get this disconnect between when the array is turning off and when you know later business hours continue. So you get a morning peak and you get an afternoon peak. So even if solar does load level your midday peak, all it does is push you into the morning peak or evening peak. And you could say, well, well, do um, you know do utilities do do industrial customers? run on-site generators to get out of paying this peak demand? And the answer is yes, they do, but they may not be allowed to do so inside of city limits. You may have to go out into the country to be able to produce those emissions. And and furthermore, that got in that led to that debate back in the 70s with PURPA, where the the manufacturers were saying, now wait a minute, we're running these generators and the generators are producing more power than what our process is. And so can't we connect to the grid and sell our surplus electricity back to the utility because it's cleaner than the grid? And so now we see net metering being kind of a, a philosophic extension of that, except the arrays are substantially smaller and substantially cleaner. And, and the other problem is you could say, well, if you're, you can't run a generator inside city limits to do demand management, 
could you run a battery? And the answer is yes, but you would have to run the battery, you know, almost the entire day to achieve any kind of demand savings. And so batteries are expensive and running your, your building all day on batteries is expensive. And so it's just too expensive. But what's happening right now in the industry is there's a syner synergy between solar and batteries where we have this peak demand energy being generated and it's, it's physically reducing the building's demand that would otherwise be up at its peak. And then when you add a battery to it, the battery doesn't need to run all day, but it can run in the morning, get recharged by solar in the afternoon, and, and provide additional load leveling in the evening. And furthermore, the battery doesn't need to run every single day. It only needs to run on those few days of maximum load, provided that you're just trying to give your, your power use a haircut and rather than try and, you know, buzz cut it. You know, the, the deeper you try to do demand management, the more fast you approach diminishing returns. So, you know, maximum, we might only be able to do demand management down to the building base load. You know, some of the things that I like to think about is, well, you know, if, if, if we can reduce our building load with uh, batteries and solar, but then we still have this period where now we get into diminishing returns, you know, what this empty space now reflects is timeframes when the manufacturer could be purchasing from the utility the cheapest electricity in the country, but is otherwise not. If anything, there's a long-term trend in utility rate structures to not price by the, the volume under the curb, which is a, a kilowatt hour, and not price by peak demand, which is kilowatt, but instead, you know, break into kind of rectangular pricing tiers that will penalize rectangles that are tall and skinny and reward rectangles that are long and horizontal. And so how do we fill in those time frames when our industrial customers are not taking advantage of the fact that they have access to the cheapest electricity in the country? And the answer is Bitcoin mining, because that's a way to convert electricity into money. And it only works in areas where electricity is cheap. And so we have this kind of convergence of, of on-site distributed renewables, digital currency, and demand rate structures that can all come together in a control system to make your building facility energy use perfectly flat and perfectly optimized. And that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of neat. Um, but what it, what it implies is that these rate structures that have been very punishing of solar because they've, you know, the, the electricity might be purchased at two cents a kilowatt hour up to, you know, six cents or seven cents a kilowatt hour. And the rest of the bill has been a demand charge and solar hasn't been able to do anything about it. Now that we have cheap batteries, it turns the economics on end. And by doing a, a right sized solar battery that just kind of it, it might not even cover the entire roof. It might just, you know, generate enough energy to knock off the peak demand through a combination of solar production and, and battery storage. And that might produce the quickest return in your area. So we're going through a really interesting time in the solar market where what we talked about before. Uh, the, the commercial market has been historically disenfranchised from the grid because they haven't had the right rate structure to take advantage of the demand energy that solar creates. Now that cheap batteries are coming to market, you know, you take a, a place like Mississippi where we get 1.4 kilowatt hours per watt per year and we have a, a 12 cent kilowatt hour rate, you know, assuming that we got uh retail net metering for our array and we had an installed cost of 250 a watt we would get a 10-year payback you know the problem is you know if you find a specialty contractor in this area uh who isn't me they'll probably charge you four bucks a watt and mississippi doesn't have net metering but let's just assume it does 
you get to that 10 year payback. And then uh, you say, well, what would that look like if instead we were on a demand rate structure? And keep in mind, it was just three years ago when the solar industry was suing Arizona Public Service because Arizona Public Service was trying to force their solar customers onto these uh, very punitive demand rate structures to overcome the revenue lost by net metering. So the, the political climate was they're on the opposite side of the fence, uh, you know, just three years ago. Well, now you go into those same markets where the price of energy is pennies and the demand charges are sky high. And instead of having a 10 year payback, you could do a, a 350 a watt array, which is the solar array plus spending a dollar a watt on batteries. And this is assuming everything's right sized and you're doing the there's design optimization algorithms based off your commercial load that solar design software now analyzes based off your utility rate structure to recommend the optimal solar uh, battery size and array size for your system economics. And that can result in economics that are within the realm of capital equipment loan financing. And so the, the commercial market, you know, the, the residential market may contract because the solar incentives are being rolled back. And the utility scale market is contracting because the solar incentives are being rolled back. But the commercial market has been, been you know, has been delayed in its growth. And now that cheap batteries are coming, you know, it, you can expect to see that market pick up a lot of momentum. You know, it's the healthiest market in the solar industry right now. So like energy tool base is a software that will take all of that information and run the, the financial algorithms and create uh, cash flow sheets that are enough to make a CFO happy. You know, there's a, a website called the desireusa.org that you can go to and research your state incentives and policies. So it's a great website, not just for incentive programs, but also figuring out the interconnection process. So it'll do net metering and uh, property tax exemptions. Uh, about 20% of the states have sales tax exemptions. I have a list of them on my website. So I have a blog and that's one of the posts. Um, and you can learn more about this stuff. Uh, you know, the one kind of thing that I think is was I think is interesting is there's a, a law that many states have called a, a solar easement or a solar access rights. And it's a law that prevents you from it's a law that says. After you build your array, your county can accept a permit, a new permit type, you know, where you go and you file an easement onto your property that protects its horizon view. So that in jurisdictions that allow these solar easements, you file it and then if your neighbor uh, doesn't trim their trees or builds a building that blocks the sun, you can take them to court for lost compensation. And like to me that sounds like something that would come out of California, you know, the the let's discuss the right to sunlight on your property. But actually the the right to sunlight on your property goes back into like 600 AD in Justinian code, where when people were living in caves with torches of animal fat, you know, their primary energy resource was the sunlight on their property. And so, you know, back into our earliest laws on record are restrictions against shading your neighbor's property. You can, you know, one of the common things you'll use Desire for is to research the uh, utility interconnection policies. Uh, sometimes at the residential level, you have to name the utility as an additional insured on an insurance on your homeowners. Uh, sometimes you don't. You know, you'll find out interconnection processes for different system sizes. Uh, I really like this magazine, Solar Pro, um, especially if you're just looking for a very uh, technical magazine uh, that's very construction and commercial and industrial focused. Uh, Solar Pro is about as serious of a magazine as it gets. 
Um, home power is much more fun, and it's not just solar. It's more focused on residential do-it-yourselfers. Um, so now there's a, a plethora of online uh, resources to help you get more into solar. You know, even checking out the inverter uh, manufacturers' websites, some of them have databases of publicly available monitoring systems. So you can uh, find that data and research it for, uh, you know, I, I did a site evaluation in Africa, and I didn't go to Africa, but there wasn't a PV watt station where I needed it to be. And so I was able to hop onto an inverter manufacturer website, find a solar array in the area, and model my production off of the, that project information. Um, solar coin is, is something I like. It's a, a digital currency for the solar industry that tracks solar production for research purposes. Doesn't have much cash value, but it's kind of fun to, to claim. Can't do much with it right now. Uh, we talked about NABCEP yesterday. Let's keep moving along. Uh, so getting back into battery design, uh, batteries are fun because it gets back into customization of the job site. So there's a, a variety of ways you can configure these systems to protect the whole house or just to protect critical loads or to protect the whole house, but then transfer to critical loads when the batteries drop below a certain amount. You know, you can have generators. There's even different ways, different modes of operation for interacting with generators where, you know, is the generator going to be there to uh, charge the batteries or are you primarily running off the generator and the solar batteries there just to help regulate the surges in the, the load. Um, in Hawaii, they have a mode where you have, it's called a zero export mode, and the batteries are not allowed to uh, export onto the grid. And so they have to enable, because they have too much solar being outflowed. And so they, they have to have the inverter be grid connected, but they also have to have the inverter dial back its production so it doesn't outflow. So there's a variety of software set settings in uh, your higher end inverters and, and in particular your higher end uh, string inverters. Okay, so we have a, another question. The question is a dollar a watt for batteries. You know, all estimates to me are $4 a watt for batteries, $2 a watt for solar, and $1 a watt for generators, all, in, all interconnected. You know, is this reasonable? And, and so, you know, it's... Doing backup power, it's generally going to be cheapest to do a generator, but it depends on how often you need that generator and, and you know, how secure you want to be during the power outage. Because, you know, I know that uh, in Hurricane Sandy, you know, one of the problems was they ran out of gas. So, you know, you're get, it, it, there is a value in risk mitigation. But there's also a value in just having the generator run more efficiently. And so if you don't need backup power regularly, then the cheapest and most economic solution will just to be get a, a portable backup generator and, and store some gas and use it during a power outage. But not everyone wants to deal with that. And, and then when you get into, you know, right now, it's not, and we get more into this into the, in the battery class, but right now, it's not economic to day trade electricity with solar. So on residential batteries where you want to store the whole uh, amount of solar energy for eight hours and then, and then move it into the evening for eight hours, you know, you're storing a day's worth of energy in that battery and you're buying so many batteries that it might be $4 a watt. So you go back to the, the commercial market and you have to understand the commercial battery bank sizing is completely different than residential because with residential, you know, you're trying to take all of this energy and maybe all of this energy and move it into the off peak hours. And so your battery has to store or your solar array has to generate, you know, all, all of this to move it over here or over here. 
Whereas on the commercial side of things, it's more like you're starting at the top of the curb. And you imagine it as a cone and you say, okay, well, how far down this cone do I want to go? And so you can stop. And that might mean that you have only a, a tiny battery that it doesn't store an hour's worth of your building energy supply. It only stores, you know, 10% of, of the hour of your building's worth because it's, it's sized for just this section and not for the entire load. And so you can get into cheaper dollar per watt rates uh, in demand management than you would if you're trying to do residential backup. And for that reason, for residential batteries, you might not even be trying to have a battery that stores more than uh, a couple hours worth of critical load because it's just, it would be too much. It would be not worth it to have a battery that, that powers your whole house, you know, and, and you just, you have to rely on the client to say, look, if you're, you know, if you're in an ice storm and all the trees are asunder, and, you, you know, you're lucky to have a solar array on your roof that during the day you have access to electricity. And we're just going to do a small battery that if, you know, you can't, you can't, your kid can't play Xbox when there's a natural disaster going on outside. You know, you have to suck it in a little bit. And maybe you just have the battery size to, to make sure that the fridge doesn't default and, uh, you know, you can keep your... Uh, cell phones charged up and, you know, a little heater running, you know, so there's, you know, the reason why the off-grid system was $80,000 is we wanted that customer to live in luxury off-grid, you know, so residential grid-connected batteries, commercial grid-connected batteries, and off-grid battery living are all three different condition sets. You know, so for, for commercials, you're, it's kind of funny because normally the larger the project is, the more economies of scale you get. But a small load leveling battery can, can just, that just shaves off these tiny peaks can actually achieve the greatest cost savings. And given that the batteries today are uh, so much worse than what they will be 10 years from now, you know, it's not a bad project strategy for commercial facility management to do a smaller solar project and a smaller battery today and then capture more performance data to better fine tune an expansion, you know, down the road when the technology improves. There's another configuration, you know, it might be that the, the utility says, well, you're connecting a solar array to the grid and we have this solar discriminatory rate structure that we're going to apply to your account. And so if you have a very small solar array and a very punitive rate structure, it could completely negate the, the savings of the array. You know, there's a, a proposal right now in Colorado uh, for a solar discriminatory rate structure that would essentially eliminate five kilowatts worth of value uh, to existing solar customers unless they added batteries to their system and, and took care of demand management. Um, and so if you just have a small array and you don't want to do a battery um, or, or you have a small array and you have a small battery and you're facing a, a solar punitive rate structure, you might you might actually get creative. So again, this is just to kind of demonstrate how flexible these systems are. But if, if normally like in half moon system, you know, right now we're doing the battery list inverter with the solar array on it. And then later we'll add a battery to it and maybe a generator on a transfer switch and have all these systems harmoniously work together. And sometimes we have grid power and sometimes we don't. But if the utility said, we're going to push you on to a punitive rate structure because you own solar, we might wire things a little differently. We might take the solar array and put it on a transfer switch so that we're always disconnected from the grid. And we might separately derive the systems. And that, that might mean that, you know, when, when the power, fit, you know, when the solar array is on, 
we're off grid and then we run on the solar and the batteries as long as we can and then it, when it gets to the point where we need to recharge the batteries we turn the you know we turn the transfer switch on of course you know those lines you go to uh uh, some utility websites are already defining uh, the definition of what a grid connected system is. And they're, you know, like Mississippi Power defines a grid connected system as any system that powers the load that our power distribution circuit uh, is sometimes connected to. So an off grid generator is now considered to be grid connected. Uh, lithium ion batteries are taking over. There's other battery types. Uh, we did for our off grid array, we did lead acid. And uh, the reason is you can get into top shelf lead acid, and it's a, a trade off between battery responsiveness and overall storage capacity. And uh, the lithium ion batteries, you can charge and discharge much more rapidly. So for a, a commercial building, absolutely you would want to do lithium ion because you're charging and recharging constantly you know, for your demand management. Uh, but for an off-grid array, you know, you might pick out appliances that are more variable speed rather than single speed. So your refrigerator, your air conditioner, and kind of level out that load. Uh, and then uh, you know, the, the responsiveness is not as important and you, you spend your money on overall storage. But in general, the, uh, the grid connected batteries are generally maintenance free batteries, whether it's AGM or lithium ion, simply because these customers wanna be able to turn their solar array on when the power is out. And for that, they need some sort of controlling inverter, which is what a battery inverter does. So when you add batteries to a grid connected residential building, you're not really trying to run the building off grid. You're just trying to enable the solar array during an emergency in a controllable manner. Uh, whereas with off grid, you want as large of a battery bank as you possibly can. And maybe lithium ion is unaffordable at that point. There's also different types of lithium ion. There's top shelf lithium ion that is jaw-droppingly expensive. And then there's like the Tesla and LG lithium ion that is, is, is less expensive, but also substantially less life. And so then you get into battery options. Well, is it better to have a 30-year battery or a four-year battery and, or a 10-year battery? And uh, the, while the 30-year battery may have the best economics, it also has the highest upfront capital cost. So, you know, that's, there's not a right solution on battery technology. It's site specific. Uh, but your, your battery inverters are getting smarter. They can go on and off the grid. Um, generally speaking, your grid connection fees have to start getting into the $100 range for it to be worthwhile just to go completely off grid. You know, that might change in the future as, as our knowledge of how to design urban off-grid homes gets better. But for now, you know, most solar customers are willing to pay some sort of connection fee simply to have access to the grid. You know, that, that'll save them, uh, you know, that'll, that'll uh, be cheaper than storing and day trading the electricity with a battery bank for some time. You know, generally, uh, in the interest of time, you know, I'm going to have to defer some of this discussion to the battery class, but there's a lot you can do with monitoring and managing your energy load. You can do service panel monitoring uh, to see the difference. You can build your own home monitoring system for your solar array and your load uh, through devices that cost a few hundred dollars and get installed inside your service panel. Uh, you know, these are good questions to think about, but we've covered the we've covered the questions in class. You know, the in Europe, they have more harsh uh, net metering laws, and it's common to see water tanks with immersed water heaters in them that communicate with uh, the your utility meter so that they will heat water in the water tank when instead of outflowing. 
You could also buy another deep freeze and put it on a timer. And there are uh, Wi-Fi radio frequency outlets now that will, uh, you know, based on how techy you are, you can go on to GitHub with an SMA inverter and download a, a robot that will power a Wi-Fi outlet that will only turn the outlet on when you're outflowing electricity. So you can put that on your deep freeze and just have the thermal mass of the deep freeze carry over. And so if you can load level some of your air conditioning, if you can load level your, your refrigeration, if you can load level your water heating, you know, there is some low hanging fruit out there to overcome some of the net metering hurdles. But, you know, the problem with efficiency projects is individually, they're all just too small. They may be very cost effective, but you can't get people to support them because they're, you know, the, the project size is small. Um, one inverter company that is worth checking out, maybe because they're a U.S. company, but also because they're pretty advanced on their system design is PICA. Because what they've done is they've said, look, we don't need module level electronics. We just need one optimizer per circuit. And there is an advantage of having the home run be at higher voltage rather than low voltage. Most battery inverters are at 48 volts. So PICA is a, a higher voltage battery inverter with a higher voltage battery bank. And they're the only company that the only battery inverter I know of that says you don't need to install the battery yet and we can combine multiple battery chemistries together. So you could do lead acid today and then add lithium ion tomorrow. Uh, the other battery inverter companies don't support multiple battery chemistries. Not to say that you can't do it. It's just that you, uh, you'll be on your own. You know, uh, we're approaching the end of our time, so I'm just going to kind of blaze through the last slides here. Uh, cable trays, uh, common on commercial projects, uncommon on residential, uh, but they sure do make the wire management look much better. You know, give some consideration to wire management. I like running my wires not inside the array, but I like running them around the perimeter just so that they're more accessible. You can get little micro inverters for commercial arrays. Uh, we talked about above ground racking. Floating solar is uh, now coming to market. It's really good for wastewater and stream wa uh, stormwater retention ponds. It, it, dis it inhibits algae bloom and it, it's free real estate and it inhibits evaporation. So there's a lot of win-wins for municipalities uh, to install floating solar on uh, on their municipal water retention ponds. Tracking is cost effective um, at the utility scale level. It's controversial whether or not tracking is cost effective at the residential level. Um, I I I don't know. Um, I've been so anti-tracking at the residential level. Uh, that I think I might be biased and, uh, you know, the, the, the advantage of tracking is that it's much more in line with demand energy. And if we're moving over to batteries, you know, anything you can do to take load off of your batteries is going to be cost effective for some time to come. And so for utility scale, it certainly seems like if you don't have rocky soil, so if there aren't boulders underneath your soil, but you can actually drive a pile into the ground, then a tracking array makes sense. You know, it'll increase your project cost uh, by, you know, around 10 to 20 percent and it'll boost your performance by 20 to 30 percent during peak times in particular. So the economics are even greater than that. The federal tax credit is going to be around until 2022, uh, but it's set to step down. And also, you know, next year uh, it may be reduced uh, more because you may be paying income tax on the tax credit. Uh, so if you want a solar array for Christmas, it's better to go ahead and buy it now. Um, I do consulting work, by the way. Solar shingles, uh, they're available. There's a, a company that makes them called Certain Teed, with T-E-E-D. So it's Certain Teed. Um, 
But, you know, the thing is, I just don't think they look very good. I've never heard solar installers speak favorably of any kind of solar shingle. Um, you know, if I'm doing a, a showpiece roof system with solar, what I'm looking at is bifacial modules, which is a, a glass on glass module that you can see through. And so, you know, if you if you are familiar with glass roofing systems, you know, then that's who you want to have design your solar roof and you just design the frame uh, to be the size of the, the solar bifacial module. So here's just some examples. Now, frameless racking, it's cool from a technology standpoint, but it's, it's very difficult to install. The glass on glass modules are heavier. If they're frameless, they break a lot easier until they're secured into the racking system. So while glass on glass looks cool and there's some kind of geeky uh, style points to have with them, you know, I would rather see things like, you know, this is a black on, this is an all black module, but the customer didn't anodize their clips. And so, like, I just did this luxury residential project. We're not going to spend $80,000 on an array and then, and then make it look ugly because the, the clips stand out. You know, by calling the, the S5 company, they referred me to one of their vendors that has an anodization shop and we were able to get the clips delivered to site anodized. Yeah, it costs more, but it looked better. Uh, just some less important stuff, thermal imaging for maintenance, drone photography, string level optimizers. And we have a class on community solar, so if you uh, are interested in that, uh, look for it. We rotate our class. And, and that's the end of the program. So I'm sorry for going slightly over. Uh, but you have my email address. I'll just put it into the, the chat again. Um, so jrscromer at gmail. If you want to get in touch, or my website is www.community.solar. You can check that out. Otherwise, you know, I'm always answering solar questions. I do consulting work. Feel free to contact me. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Tim. Okay, great. Thanks, JR. Thanks, everybody in attendance. That concludes this webinar series. I'll close things down here. Everybody will be sent over to that brief quiz I mentioned earlier. Just a few questions. Uh, if you don't, it's to prove attendance, too. If you don't want to take it immediately, um, everybody will be able to access it in a follow-up email about one hour after we leave today. Everybody gets that email, so if you've already taken the quiz, you don't have to take it twice. Uh, your certificates will be emailed to you within five business days, uh, so by next Friday, and also if we've received a quiz from you. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you all again, and here's your quiz.